right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, angels and demons, monsters and serpents. This is Brothers of the Serpent Podcast, and we are coming to you not live from the 10 by 10 by 10 Tangent Cube of Science, where we are nestled amongst the dusty bones of an ancient seabed high atop the Edwards Plateau. So, we had big plans this week for an interview that I think many of you are going to find very interesting, but plans fell through and that interview didn't work out. We're going to do it in the future, though, so look forward to that. You will see what it's about when it comes out. But uh, meanwhile, we had another interview scheduled this week with Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? So we turned this into a swap cast. So this episode is a long and excellent and fun conversation between me and Kyle and Soraya on many topics. Uh, and hope, hope you guys enjoy it. And, yeah, I was uh, like, let's do news stories. All right. And then we did like three, maybe somewhere in there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, did news stories and, uh, you know, just all the conversations that come up and talking electric universe. And uh, we talked about the Feynman stuff and went over some of the Book of the Damned. Yeah, lots of that. Yeah. Yeah, it was a good uh, all round. Yeah, classic where did the road go conversation. Yes. Where. Yes. Did the road go? I keep thinking every time we're on with him and we're having these types of conversations, the name of his podcast always comes up. I'm like, yes, yeah, yes. where did the road go? This totally makes sense. <laughs> How did we get here? It's a great name. <laughs> uh, and it's always it's always a good time sitting down and having a conversation with him. So. Yes, it is. So this episode will have a bit of a different format because it was a swap cast. So in the beginning, you'll hear Soraya doing the intro, and then we basically just do two segments with one break. So. But other than that, I think it's a great conversation. So we'll get to that. Let's just tackle some space weather news first. From spaceweather.com. For your weekly dose of space weather news, slight chance of storms. NOAA forecasters say there is a slight chance of minor G1 class geomagnetic storms today. Earth enters a high speed. Uh, let's see. As Earth enters a high speed stream of solar wind, the gaseous material is flowing from a southern hole in the sun's atmosphere. Current conditions, wind speed is 548.1 kilometers per second and the density is 9.17 protons per cubic centimeter. Sunspot number is 32, that's way down. And the neutron count is 2.3% above the space age average, which is rated as elevated. KP index is three, quiet, and the 24 hour max is also three. And that is your space weather news for the week. Uh, anything else? I guess we'll do a crypto, and then we'll mm. let's take a look crypto. at crypto. Starting to crypto up a little bit. <laughs> uh, let's see. Oh, yes. Bitcoin, 22822 dollars and 92 cents, and Ethereum, $1,616.55. There you go. There's your space for the news and your crypto. All and, right. uh, yeah, we have a bunch of emails. Maybe we'll tackle that on... Very soon, we're going to have to have a communications episode. And I want to try to get Laura in here for that. I'm okay. thinking about yeah, that today. Cool. So we need to set that up. I was just remembering how people have said, you need to get her back in there. And I agree. So yeah. we'll do that. Meanwhile, here's our conversation with Soraya from Where Did the Road Go? Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And I have back with me in this sort of swap cast edition, the Snake Brothers. That's right. How's it going, buddy? Uh, I, I am doing good, and uh, I, I hear you are doing good as well. Yes, that's right. It's hot, it's dry, but <laughs> otherwise, thanks to technology, we're doing good. That's right. It is yeah. It is harvest season for us, so we're... August is always our busiest month in terms of, you know, the the grapes and the farming and the wine. So, um, how hot is it there? You're in, you're in mid Texas. Yeah, so up high nineties, and then I mean we've had many many days over a hundred degrees yep. so far this summer. Um, yeah, which is you know that's kind of it's I wouldn't say it's abnormal, but last summer we got spoiled. Because it was nice and cool all summer, I feel like. Yeah, it was. 
This this summer has been more normal in terms of Texas heat, I think. Yeah. Uh, but it has definitely been a very dry year for us, and I know for many other people. So. Yeah, it's been hot and dry. Hotter, touch hotter than normal, not not severely. I mean, I remember back in the '90s where it was consistently over a hundred and humid. Mm. But it's been more dry here and like hitting between like the upper 80s and lower 90s. So, yeah, well, we're we're like we're de- uh, desert adjacent, you know? Yeah. So we're used to dry summers, but we usually get a lot of rain in the springtime and we didn't get that either. So it's I think we've gotten like, what, three inches this year yeah. so far, something like that. It's yeah, that's, we're way below average rain at our weather station. Yeah. Yeah. yeah la- la- last year it was. Would it stop raining for like three days in a row? That would be cool. And this year it's like, <laughs> could we get rain for more than five minutes at a time? Yeah. yeah. That's yes. that's pretty much where we're at too. Last year we had record rainfall and um, it was, I guess it was what, September it really came down. Yep. Um, but yeah, it was an, we hardly ever had to irrigate anything last year. Yeah. Mm. We turned on the irrigation of the grapes a couple of times maybe. And this year that's all it's been. That's you know? right. So, so uh, you guys had done. We were, we were going to start this talking about Charles Fort. Yes, you guys did a what nine part series on Charles Fort? Yeah, I think it was nine. It might have been ten. I can't remember, but it's probably nine parts. Uh, one of the longest book reports we've ever done. Man, what a fantastic book! Full of a yes. just absolutely amazing stuff. And you know, it was it was Fort's tough to digest. When you're reading it, it's just oh, he's got a strange style. Um, what do you mean? I don't know. His writing style is just weird, at least in my opinion. So it's it's just it's just strange to read it. And I've heard from so many people. You know, I tried to start that book and I just couldn't couldn't get through it. So he doesn't would, he doesn't like to he doesn't like periods. Yes, he, he doesn't does. like to end <laughs> sentences. Right. He's he's fond of of commas and you know and hyphenation, but he doesn't like to end a sentence. So you hmm. can. Uh, and he'll put, you know, four or five different trains of thought in one sentence and try to string them all together, looping them around and stuff like a weave. And it's just, t- it can be tough. So it was fun to go through it. And, uh, you know, we, of course, we did our standard, like, abridged version. We don't read the whole thing, but we do read select parts and, and go, through right. the, go through the cases and, and the, all the stuff that Fort brings up, all the instances of strangeness that Fort brings up. And, uh, and this is, this was Book of the Damned. That's right, Book of the Damned. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I haven't read it in a long time. I don't, rem- you know, because I've read a lot of stuff from the turn of the the last century. Um, I don't, I didn't find it that weird, you know. Yeah, like so maybe it's more that he doesn't write like modern writers do. Do he didn't have the same type of editing, you know? Yeah, it, it's it's that partially, but it's just it's also just kind of the way he. Uh, Stream of stream of thought. Yes, almost. it's stream of consciousness, and he sort of rambles a bit, yeah. you know. Um, and he's got this. Uh, what were we calling it? That he doesn't ever say, you know, I think this, or he doesn't use the first person. He'll say we, you know. No. Uh, you know, he'll so he'll he'll he kind of sort of tries to separate himself from the text, and you know, he'll say, you know, we we will see this, or we consider this to be this thing, um, and. It just, I don't know, it's just a strange style, but he has his own style for sure. And after a while, you kind of get used to it. But still, every once in a while in the book, you come across a giant block of text that's almost incomprehensible, you know, <laughs> and then we read it a couple of times. We're like, what is he saying? And then eventually you can sort of work it out by disentangling the knots of thoughts in the uh, in the in the sentence. But it was still it was a great it was a it was a lot of fun. And just I don't know, I love the just one anomaly after another. Um, yeah. And then his, you know, he does the thing where he, he's like, okay, so looking through the journals, we see that there was someone in the scientific world who took it upon themselves to go investigate some of these instances. And then you just see that that person went out there usually for the express purpose of, of, uh, debunking. Yeah. Basically debunking it, you know, like saying this is not a big deal or they're making up stories about how, this possibly happened like you know coal fell out of the sky and the guy's like well the fire truck you know threw a bunch of coal on the ground while it was raining and uh <laughs> no one noticed until they came out and they thought the coal from the fire truck had just fallen out of the sky 
right, uh, right. or somebody was playing a, a prank you know people thought fish were raining out of the sky but really it was some kid who threw a bucket of fish on the guy's head and uh you know it was just like some of the most <laughs> ridiculous attempts at debunking and of course fort you know just destroys it in his way and it, it was it was a lot of fun the other thing that's really great about his about fort though is his philosophy of, of oh, the, yeah. the intermediate the intermediatist yes so he the the idea that through the scientific method we have to categorize things we have to separate one thing from another and give it a term give each one a term that makes them distinct from from each other so that we can talk to each other about these things but his philosophy is like yes you you have to do this in order to communicate but you also have to remember all the time that these things aren't really distinct there is no perfect dividing line between one thing and another they sort of merge together in this there's all this intermediateness between two distinct things yeah and so it's pretty cool as you go through his his way of looking at the world that you see yeah like the lines are blurred everywhere yeah and we forget that because of our language and the way we need to make things distinct in order to kind of have be able to understand each other it's it's interesting i i like how he would also point out that scientists were saying that rocks didn't fall from the sky yeah <laughs> these stupid farmers just thought saw lightning strike a rock on the ground and thought it fell from the sky yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah yes that kind of stuff was fantastic like starting with like okay here's something that is accepted now but not too long ago, it wasn't accepted. And yeah. look at how they tried to debunk the reports that people had seen, you know, basically rocks falling out of the sky. And then you, and then later he would compare that to current debunking attempts, you yeah. know, for other yeah. anomalous events. And you, you can see the comparison. It's like, yeah, now they accept that rocks fell out, of, fell out of the sky, but look at what they were saying about people who thought that when science didn't think that. <laughs> and then you can kind of compare it to what they're saying to people who think that fish fall out of the sky or find worms crawling around on snow after a snowfall, you know, just right. all right. of the, all of these accounts that he had were so amazing. And then he would also do that, like the intermediatist thing that Kyle was talking about. He would do this really interesting thing with each kind of event where he would start out saying, here's, let's start out with stuff that kind of looks like comets. And then as you go through the chapter, they, the comet things sort of slowly become more and more like ufos yeah and it, he's sort of trying to demonstrate for you that there is there there's this strange blurriness that it's difficult to categorize these things for, you know uh from one to the other well i think any of this unexplained stuff you're, you're dealing with a myriad of actual explanations and not and i'm not talking like conventional explanations i think there's numerous weird things going on you know, like 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 with Bigfoot accounts, you you might be seeing a, a, a flesh and blood ape that we're not familiar with, but at the same time, it might just be poltergeist activity, or it might be a spirit of some sort. And the, and, and I think that all of this stuff kind of blurs from one thing to the next. Yes, like, like you're saying there, and it's like it's not so simple as there's one explanation that's going to explain all these cases. That's right. That's right. And and, and stuff falling from the sky. I mean. Like, I know there was a, a blood fall in India within mm -hmm. the last 10 years where they actually got to analyze it. And they said that this, it was blood, but it didn't have, it was missing some normal component you found in blood. Yeah. And I don't remember, and they didn't really have a good explanation from where it came from, but they could confirm that, yep, it, it came from the sky and we don't really know what's going on here. Yeah. And there've been other blood accounts and they've been explained away as, you know, birds get caught in like some kind of cyclone and it tears them apart. And then it right. rains their blood down three weeks later over a different town, you know, and you're just like, <laughs> I don't know about this. <laughs> or what type of fish or frog suddenly rains down in mass amounts and it's like, well, a whirlwind picked them up. It's like, but nothing else? Yeah. Yeah. Fort had a great uh what was the thing he it said? It was about marksmanship. The, yeah. There was <laughs> there was the marksmanship problem, which is that uh, you know, that that frogs or fish or something like that would rain over this small sort of targeted area yeah uh and then a, a week or two or a couple of days well or the whatever. scientists would come in and explain it as being a cyclone yeah that's right they would explain <laughs> it as as being a water spout or yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. and then a, a week later 
frogs or fish or whatever would rain again over that same exact spot. And yep. so he called that mark. You know, how do you explain the marksmanship if it's just a random uh, funnel? You know, a funnel of air picking up. And then he would also talk. What did he say? He would say he said, "I think you would hear from somebody who had lost a pond." Yeah, yeah. They <laughs> they said, you know, a, a tornado came by and sucked up some farmer's pond, and then rained the the frogs from the pond down over the little town. And that's their explanation. And then a week later, the frogs rain on that town again. Right. <laughs> but Fort's, you know, the, the 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 funny thing about going through the Book of the Damned is is Fort's own explanations and how he doesn't take himself seriously. Yeah, which is which is just hilarious. You know, he you can tell as you're reading it that he knows he's just he's just speculating wildly. But he starts talking about interstellar spacecraft carrying cargo. Yeah, you know, yeah. and they're dropping things or whatever. Uh, and then he also he he. He speculates about some ability. What did he call it? The, the Sargasso Sea. Sargasso, yeah, the yep. Super Sargasso Sea. Yep. Super Sargasso Sea. sea that's <laughs> yeah, that's right. Some place in the sky that has all this biological material that occasionally will just rain it down on the planet. And th and that comes from a spot in the middle of the Atlantic called the Sargasso Sea, where stuff just tends to collect. Like, yes, uh, it's where it's where the currents kind of make a, a circular area, and when stuff goes in, it tends not to come out very often. Right. That's right. But wow. every once in a while, every once in a while, you'll have a bunch of weird stuff wash up on some shoreline because that yeah. stuff got, you know, escaped from that Sargasso Sea. That's right. Um, hey, let's do a diving expedition out there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, imagine all the stuff that might be out there. Um, the, the stuff falling from the sky, I mean, you can compare to, you know, things like rocks falling during poltergeist encounters. Yep. So you got to wonder, like, is that being generated by that particular area for some reason? And again, you know, like with the rocks, where the, where are they coming from? I mean, they're at ports, if that's the case. But we don't really understand how that works at all. Yeah, that's right. I mean, there's just there there isn't a good explanation for for a lot of that stuff that Fort reported. I mean, some of it is just, you know, you're you're when you're when you get away from even talking some of the weirder cases where you're not even talking about frogs or fish or something that you could explain as well well a, a water spout picked this up from some lake where it's like uh meat you know yes. like some yeah. kind of just bloody strange and I'm sorry for anybody who's squeamish but just you know they go out on the ground and there's like a whole strip of land that's coated in this nasty meat material yeah. Yeah. Uh, that smells really bad. And then, you know, and, and then inevitably in some of the reports, someone tastes it, you yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or at least they just tell you what it tastes like. And you're like, <laughs> right. well, wait a minute. Wait a second. <laughs> I, I, I know we talked about it somewhere on one of my shows recently. Uh, there was one of the cases like that where stuff fell from the sky and someone tasted it and it was good. And they were like, oh, we'll just eat this. And it's like, yeah. It fell from the sky. Don't put it in your mouth. <laughs> yep, there was plenty of accounts where uh, what was it? The the manna stuff, the uh yeah. the flakes that fell from heaven and then there was always the report, you know, locals made bread out of it. Bread was yeah. like tasteless yeah. and <laughs> wouldn't rise, you know. Just like strange strange people. Just like, okay, there's weird black worms crawling around in the snow after a snowstorm. I'm going to eat one. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah sure why not yeah and now, that nowadays nowadays would be a tiktok challenge yeah that's right somebody would do it on tiktok that's right yeah and some of the some of those accounts um i think the one with the weird bread stuff the mana flakes or whatever that were falling from the sky the the, the flakes that people made bread with those were explained away as what did he say it was lichen lichen from the yeah, Mongolian steps or something like that. I can't remember. It was something like that. <laughs> the, the scientific explanation was that it was lichen, you know, so it was a fungus or whatever. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, God, what a great book, though. Just yeah, absolutely I haven't, fantastic. I haven't read it in, in a while, but uh, I remember just being astonished at the, the array of weirdness there. Yeah. Well, you don't have to read it. You got nine it's, episodes of Brothers of the Serpent you can true. listen to. <laughs> and and they are in my queue. I just haven't started yet because there's nine episodes. Right. <laughs> yep. It's a it's a commitment.
Because <laughs> <laughs> once I start listening to episode one, I'm I'm just gonna go through all nine of them. Right. Like I'm not gonna stop and be like, I'll listen to episode two after I listen to other stuff. It's like, nope. Now that I've started. <laughs> Well, it's only like 20 hours, so I come on. <laughs> um, it's like a part-time job. You can do it in one week. <laughs> I, I wonder how Fort would deal with current stuff. With current anomalies, you mean? Like yeah, present day? Uh, yeah. I don't know. I mean, because he just looked for newspaper clippings that didn't, you know, of weird things that didn't fit in. Yeah, newspaper clippings, scientific journals. Uh, I mean, he was he spent a lot of time in the... I guess it was the, what was it, the library in New York and then the one in London? Yeah. Looking yeah. at these and just going through any, you know, he's, he, he describes in the book how he gave himself a cutoff time. He's like, I'm not going to go back more than a couple of hundred years. Uh, right. But he's like, right. you, still, you still find these anomalies going back. But he's like, I, I have a cutoff point of a, maybe, maybe it was the 1800s. I can't remember exactly what his cutoff point was, but he was like, I have to, I have to draw some lines myself. You know, and uh, even then he found so much stuff. And it's interesting. You wonder, do those kinds of reports make it into those kinds of journals these days or not? I don't think so. Yeah. I think they've been, they've been, uh, air well, quotes, cleaned up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You, you would, you see them in newspaper articles, though. Yeah. Every well, once in a while. You did read that story. What was it the other day on a, on the show that was Fortean about there was the glowing one, sea? Yeah, there's one with the glowing sea because he did talk about these these oh, yeah. strange uh, people yeah. witness the the seas glowing and there's bands of glowing light um, going past yeah. them when they're out at sea. So there's a recent story um, about this where there's scientists actually looking at this. They're able to see it from satellite images now, but they didn't have they've never been able to correlate both an on site um, you know, photography witness report, and, and yeah. witness, you know, eyewitness accounts with photography or video with the satellite imagery of the same event. And they've, they finally got one. So some people with, you know, probably cell phone cameras and stuff were recording it at sea. Yeah. They were in it and it, what it, it really reminds you of some of the stuff that Fort is talking about where yeah. there's this like dim glowing, light that seems to be emanating from deeper in the ocean. It's not just floating on the surface like a typical or, or, or it's in not, the waves, uh, yeah. and it's continuous glowing. Unlike a lot of the, uh, what is it? The, the, the bioluminescence, the plankton or whatever it is. It's supposed to do that. Yeah. Why can't I think of what they're called? But anyway, yeah, they kind of light up and then shut off and that's kind of normal. You see, you know, in the crashing waves, you'll see them light up. Uh, but then yeah, they takes, go out. It takes a little bit of, I don't know, some kind of energy. You can also rub your hand. If it's really strong, you can rub your hand back and forth on the wet sand after a wave has yeah. crashed and make them light up. We've seen, yeah. we've witnessed this ourselves, but these, these accounts are talking about, you know, the a entire steady glow, a steady glow. The entire ocean is glowing and it's not the surface. It's coming down from down deep. Yeah. So that well, was what, pretty cool. I was like, Hey what man, was the what was the explanation? They have they no they explanation whatsoever for this. Yeah. All right. It was a report, a lot like the stuff that Fort would read, you know, so there was a report from people who were there on a boat, and the boat was in the middle of the event, and there were scientists who were able to look at the event from satellite images, but there was yeah. there yeah. was no attempt to give any kind of explanation, which was really interesting. The, uh, the Contiki expedition that Thor Heyerdahl did, uh, when they were in the middle of the Pacific at one point, the, the ocean started glowing around them. Mm. Do you guys remember this thing that happened a um, few years back, maybe five or six years back, where uh, there was the ocean was glowing red? The pilots, these all these pilots were reporting, you know, flying over this area of the ocean. And they're looking down, and it's just all lit up, yeah, bright red. Do you remember this? I do. Yeah, there yeah. were images of it on the news and stuff. That that was yeah. Some of the strange. pilots took pictures out of the plane windows. It was huge. Yep. Huge lights on the sea, yeah, over the North Pacific, I think. They were flying to Alaska. And I mean, I would assume this has a natural explanation we're just not aware of. Well, yeah, it has some kind of explanation. Well, sure, but yeah. I mean, like like, like a natural like animal or something like that that we're not familiar with. I mean, it could be underwater UFOs. We see that. 
even though people don't talk about them a lot, I mean, there's uh, plenty. I mean, UFOs are more likely to go into a body of water than into the sky. Yeah. Like the most common thing they do is disappear. The second most common thing they do is disappear into a body of water. Yeah. Yeah, it could be UFOs, but it it the thing about those lights, the, the ones that Kyle brought up specifically, was how bright they were. Uh, it was bright enough to where the... Um, you know, the attempted explanation that was given uh, was that it was a fleet of fishing vessels. Right, I remember it that. It was too bright to be explained away as some kind of bioluminescence. Not, not that that's impossible for bioluminescence to be really bright, but it usually isn't the kind of brightness you get from artificial lights or technological lights, uh, which right, is what right. this seemed to be. And it was also, these guys were taking photographs from, from cruising altitude, 30,000 feet, and the light, the light area covered a large portion of the ocean that they could see, which means it was enormous. So I don't, I don't really understand how they could explain it as a f fleet of fishing vessels because it was too big yeah. and it was also too bright to be bioluminescent. So I don't know what it was, but, you know, it's well, it, 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 I mean, underwater volcanoes was given up as an explanation. There was a lots of interesting ideas. I mean, it could be something plasma formed. Yeah. Yeah, it could be it could be that kind of unknown natural phenomena, ball lightning type stuff, but it would still yeah. have been whatever it was would have been enormous or it wasn't as far below them as they thought. They everybody yeah. was assuming it was down in the ocean. But Enor or, or enormous or a lot of it, a lot of smaller bits of it that looked like one. Yeah. Yep. Hmm. But a bunch of dim light doesn't usually become really bright light. It can true, it true. Can, it can glow, sort of, but it isn't going to be super bright. I don't know. It was a, that was a really strange and interesting report. Yeah, I'm. I'm. Well, I guess they did try to debunk it as fishing boats. Yeah, I was going to say I'm surprised there weren't some some more lame uh, explanations. Well, fishing boats is pretty lame. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I mean, it would have been a lot of fishing boats if it if that's what it was. I mean, and that's the thing. The explanations, these people are so desperate just to explain away the weirdness that, that their explanations are usually nonsense. Yeah, it it's it's like they're they feel like they have to forestall the weird explanations. Right. They have to come out yeah. and just, you know, that even if even if there's no evidence whatsoever that it is what they think it is, they're trying to say it's more likely to be fishing boats than it is to be aliens is what they're really saying. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. It's actually Cthulhu. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it was. <laughs> he was just popping his head up. For yeah, it was the what's his city called? The city of Riley. Riley. Yeah, Riley. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although we always expect green light with Cthulhu, red works. Yeah, there was some purple in there. That's Cthulhu-ish. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, with any of this stuff, you get the 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 skeptics who are so certain. There's and to me that just suggests that they are terrified of things they can't explain. They're not skeptics because they're so yeah. certain. Yeah. I mean, right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Skeptics question. Right. That's why. So the other, the other thing is, and we did a, I think we did some reporting on this book a long time ago, but I, one of Ivan T. Sanderson's books, he actually goes into, and like, he, he tackles a bunch of cryptids. So it's, it's a good book yeah. for that. But he also uh, goes into some of the ocean, the anomalous ocean lights. Well, he did a whole book on that. Yeah. Uh, an underwater UFOs. It's yeah, fantastic. That's right. He's one of the few people who has done that. It's kind of an untapped sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, but he specifically had a bunch of work on those, what are they, the, the what do they call them? The wheels? It looks like wheels in the water. Yes. Or yeah, they that, were... And that's what, that's what Thor Heyerdahl, Heyerdahl uh, the Contiki expedition saw. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> nice I, recovery. I, I, yeah, yeah, it is good. That was smooth. I, I can't say it. <laughs> yeah, I, sometimes, I, okay. Yeah, I liked I liked Sanderson's idea that um that it was a, it was a problem of perspective with those bands of light. You know, he was he had this cool explanation at least for some of the reports where he was like cuz it cuz the reporters the the people reporting it, the event would say there seemed to be a a hub out far away from the ship, and then there were these spokes coming past them. Yeah. And so it looked like a wheel. Fort reported on this, too. Was, yeah, Fort yeah. had some of this in his book, and we went through it. Uh, 
and Sanderson was saying, well, maybe this is a problem of, of perspective. Uh, that, you know, maybe the bands are all actually parallel lines, but because they're so huge and they go so far out into the distance that it looks like it's a, a rotating wheel. Yeah, I think we I think we tried to figure this out. Um, Some of the reports, we it didn't work four, out. Yeah, yeah, because when they looked in the other direction, they were spreading apart. Yeah, that's right. But in some cases, they the it seemed like the ship was on that there were two wheels like and they were gear. rotating. Yeah, yeah, that they were rotating opposite each other, and and so Sanderson's explanation was this was a problem of perspective. Huh. But still, it was it's enormous parts of the ocean being lit up in this in this way. But the but the specific event we're talking about that Kyle reported on a couple of days ago on our show or last week was just a steady glow. It's not bands of light. So there was a, an article I pulled out to talk about potentially on this show that talks about how we do not see in three dimensions. And that, that I mean, with a lot of this stuff, I, I feel like our perceptions are, are not what we think they are. Uh, and so this was a quote. Um, it, well, so it's basically talking about how the way of the way that we see things is influenced by our culture and our experience and stuff like that. Like we learn to see in three dimensions. Uh, right. And that oh, that just totally took me away from where I needed to be. And now I don't know where I am. Well, I definitely cool. I definitely don't think in three dimensions or see in three dimensions. Now <laughs> I know this. <laughs> so there, there's an illusion, and I got to pull up the web view here to to see. It's it's illusion of two lines that, if you look at them, most people would say they're different different lengths, but they're actually the same length. But it said that. Um, let me see here. Okay, uh, it's not. We've actually learned how to see this stuff improperly. Hmm. Um, for instance, research has shown the significant cross-cultural variation in responses to the Mueller lion liar illusion. And so what it is, it's, it's one line that has a couple of arrow points in it, and then it has the same two lines, but separated. And it says, as a result, having the wrong course of childhood experience might leave, lead us to perceive certain things wrongly. Interesting, there, interestingly, there may be real world examples of this. For instance, um, oh, yeah, so across, yeah, I started up where I was. Europeans find the illusion much more powerful than members of traditional African cultures. The cause of the illusion and the reason for this cross cultural variation is not well understood. Some have uh, hypothesized that susceptibility to illusion is a result of living in carpent carpentered environment with lots of right angles. Hmm. Others have hypothesized that it's due to spending a lot of time looking at two-dimensional images of three-dimensional objects. Whatever the case is, the fact that our way of seeing the illusion is influenced by culture shows that it is a product of experience and not biologically hardwired. Yeah, I, okay, so Kyle pulled it up. I see what's happening with those arrow lines. You're, you're, well, I think I see what's happening. What my brain is trying to tell me is that their pers the, the arrows on the ends are perspective lines. Yeah. So it makes the uh, it makes one of them look closer to you than the other, and so the one that is uh, farther away looks longer because you think it's farther away. That's I think mm. what's supposed to be happening there. Yes. Yeah. So if yeah. I if I would describe it for the listeners, there's there's one line that has arrows at the ends, and the arrow shapes are pointing outwards. Yes. So and then there's another line that has the arrow shapes pointing in towards the line. And those look like perspective lines. So I can I can see how the lines may look, they appear longer and shorter, but they're actually the same length. I think that's the goal. That's the, that's yes. the point. Yeah, okay. That, that is exactly the point. Yeah. And, and it's the fact that our brain doesn't, you know, with any optical illusion, it's, it's showing us, it's interpreting. Yeah, there's, and there's I interpretation, yeah. And I don't think people understand the level of interpreting our brains do. Right. So especially when you're seeing something that is completely new or novel or unknown, your brain can go anywhere with that. It's like, I, yep, maybe it's this, you know? Yeah. So, and I think that that includes seeing lights under the water. It's going to be hard to judge that because it's not something we're, we're used to seeing. Yeah. There's a couple of, there's a couple of things that I always think of with this 
especially when you're talking about stuff that's just more enormous than we can really deal with. You know, perspectives in space, for one thing, are would be, you can imagine how difficult they would be. Like, you know how, um, for example, uh, meteor showers are supposed to have a radiant point, like a a point in the sky that they see that the, all the meteors for that particular shower seem to come from. They originate from that and fly out from it in every direction. Right. But that's that's just a problem of, of perspective. They're not coming from that point. They're not all radiating out. It's that we're intersecting a band of material, but the band is so enormous that it it has a vanishing point. Yeah. So yeah. The, va- the vanishing point is the radiant in our perspective, but it looks like they are all coming from a single place and radiating outwards. And, and you know, that's part of the problem with, with any kind of astronomy. I mean, we're looking out from a single point. Yeah, that's right. And we're trying to make deductions based on that. And I, and I think we do a decent job, but I think we also make some assumptions that don't work. Yeah. And then we don't like letting go of those things. That's right. Now, just as people in general, we don't like letting go of the things we believe. It's like, oh, that makes so much sense. That's what I'm going with. It proves, that, and then when you see evidence that that's not the case, it's like, no, I, I, I still think it's the case. Yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's a human thing, you know. We, we, we like to stick to those beliefs. So, are you tying, are you tying this somehow to, uh, to the way people interact with other paranormal phenomena? Is yeah. that what you're thinking? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's something I've been, I've been talking about a lot lately. Um, and again, it goes back to that invisible gorilla stuff. Like the, the, the level to which our perceptions deceive us and reinterpret things and add stuff and take stuff out versus what's really there are two hugely different things. Right. And that's not and that's not to say people aren't having paranormal experiences, you know, that they're I'm not saying people are misinterpreting normal things. I'm saying that when you have a paranormal experience, your brain doesn't always know what to do with it. Yeah. Or it tries to do stuff with it and can possibly give you a very skewed perspective of what happened. Is that that's right. kind of what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because, uh, you know, years ago, one of, one of this, this was always a great example to me, the, the Google blimp. Uh, if I remember right, it went like haywire and it was seen over a whole part of, I want to say the Midwest, maybe Tennessee, somewhere in there. Uh, and a whole bunch of people reported it and all the reports matched, you know, like and, and to me, a, it said people are reporting what they see, because that's one of the whole thing with UFOs. People say, oh, well, you know, people are just mistaken. Well, the blimp, which we were later able to find out was just this Google blimp. They all described accurately. There was no ridiculous explan- you know, descriptions or anything else. Yeah. All the descriptions were very accurate to what these people were seeing, even though they didn't know what they were seeing. Man. But two people can have a U- two or three people can have a UFO encounter and all see completely different things. Yeah. So see, that, you- that right there illustrates a way to do scientific tests on this type of thing. Like you can an organization really interested in this stuff with a budget could put things into the sky and fly them randomly in places without saying anything and get get the reports get the reports and and actually study them when when the whatever the phenomenon is is known yeah to the people who set it up yeah oh isn't that kind of what our military does <laughs> yeah but we don't have that data man yeah no we don't <laughs> yeah. i'm talking about you know public stuff here but yeah, that would be a way to study it and to to be able to come up with a, some good probabilities of accuracy. Uh, uh, yep, you know what I mean. And this goes back to Fort. He, Fort was constantly pointing out how the scientific establishment of his time and the years previous in the journals that he was reading were were using their ability to sort of look down their noses at regular people and their explanations for what they saw as a way to debunk the weirdness. Yeah, you know oh, yeah. that that that's the whole point is that there was there was always somewhere in there, in the explanation that was being given by the authorities at the time, they were just like, well, these peasants don't know what they saw. Yes, you know? yes. Stupid farmers think the rocks fell from the sky. Right. Yeah. You know, it's like what. And then you know, with UFO things, you get you know police reports, and even then, you know, the skeptics will be like. Oh, well, they were just mistaken. They saw Venus. They chased Venus through the entire state. Right. Yeah. 
Yeah, all the all these all these police officers were just chasing Venus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what you know what bothers me? Chasing Venus. We've been what? farming for six years and I mean I haven't seen anything crazy come from the sky <laughs> out there. But yeah, there's the so many accounts of farmers finding crazy shit in their fields. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's the deal, yeah. universe? Why are we being left out? Yeah. We became farmers just to experience this weirdness <laughs> because that's who it happens to. You, so you wanted the abduction experience like uh, Antonio there where he was brought up onto the ship and had sex with an alien. And well, I was thinking more like pancakes, you know. <laughs> I was thinking of like a giant uh, steel ball that buried itself in the in the soil out well, there. Well, that would be field, cool too, you know? yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. That rolls on its own and stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Bets Sphere. Well, that's it. Yeah. That's, I was trying to remember what the name of it was. <laughs> and that's one of those things where you look at the weirdness around it, you're like, I have no idea if this is actually weird or not. Yeah. So I have a... Oh, go ahead. Go, no, go ahead. Well, I have a I have a story that kind of goes back to, to the ocean stuff that we were talking okay. about. This is... Uh, um, I don't have to read the whole thing, but basically, uh, let's see, where can I start here? Um, they found a series, they, they found these strange, weird holes in the bottom of the ocean, like 2,000 oh, feet yeah. under yeah. water with this, with this, you know, underwater drone hmm. sub. And they look artificial. Yeah, they're in a straight line. They're in, and there's multiple sets of these that they find. They're in straight lines. They're sort of dash shaped holes. So think of a dotted line, and yeah. they're excavated. They have little piles of the of the sediment laying next to them, like wow. something dug them out. Oh man. Um, they do give a measurement, but basically the scientists are trying to figure out. Uh, you know, after uh, it says after a remotely operated camera noticed the oddities on July twenty third. 2022, uh, this was a NOAA ocean exploration voyage to the ridge. Uh, they're, they're in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, north of the Azores, okay. by the way. All right. The holes are about 2,540 meters below the sea surface. God. They form nearly straight lines and look organized. Uh, let's see. Let's see. Um, the second voyage to the ridge... To, 2022 expedition, they observed several sublinear sets of holes in the sediment on the seafloor at a depth of approximately 2,540 meters. While the holes look almost human-made, the little piles of sediment around them suggest they had been excavated. We attempted yeah. but were not able to take a peek into the holes and poke them with the tools on the remotely operated vehicle. It was also not apparent as to whether the holes were connected beneath the sediment surface. So anyway, they have no idea about these, but they they had been previously observed before as well uh, in some other expedition. But uh, you know what that sounds like is an exploratory, exploratory trenches. See, I was thinking it was like some kind of um, you know the UFO is under there, and it's got these little you know gas relief jets. They're just like. Pfft. Oh yeah, <laughs> it's like I don't know. I just was thinking buried UFO, <laughs> right? <laughs> but it's are? but it's also the kind of ex, you know the exploratory trench you would a bunch of them little pits you would make if you're looking for an archaeological site. Yeah, yeah. And if it's near the Azores, you know. Now these are really small. Uh, let me see. Yeah, they, what is the size? They of they have the sizes in here. Um, I'll I'll find them here in a second. Okay. Yeah, that's amazing. The only, other, the only other thing I can think of is, I mean, there are certain sea animals that actually create art. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's and a good point. So, I mean, maybe there could be something down there we're not aware of that's digging these holes for whatever reason. Well, clearly, you just need to follow the dotted line to the end. Oh, well, that yeah, would make sense. Why didn't they do that? <laughs> so, it says, each set of holes appeared track-like. Lengths of individual series ranged from... Uh, less than one meter to many meters. Uh, each was straight or gently curved. Some series intersected or crossed. Close examination of the holes showed them to be elongate, with the long axis parallel to the axis of the series. So, like a dotted, like a yeah. dotted line or yeah. a dashed line. 
Uh, oh. The holes were, uh, what is it? it says? The holes were CA dot six by one point five centimeters. What does mm. CA stand for there? I don't no know. Idea. With so six by one and a half centimeters, so they're one and a half centimeters wide, six oh, centimeters long. Okay, so they're long. very small. So they're not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With distance between the holes similar to the hole length. The holes that appeared to be most recently formed were each surrounded by raised sediment. Holes that appeared older were partly filled with sediment and the raised surrounding sediment was less obvious. Mm. So it wasn't done all at once. Right? No, yeah. Some of them are older, some of them are new. Pretty cool. Huh. Yeah, so that the, being that small, I mean, they're, they're long tracks, but they're small, <laughs> so maybe they are... Maybe it is some kind of animal. Yeah, it's, it seems like it would be some kind of animal, but it's it's strange how regularly they regular they yeah. are, you know. Yeah. Hmm. I, I I don't know. So, like like my guess would be some sort of animal, but that's just a guess. Yep. A mud worm. <laughs> that's what it is. <laughs> uh, it's, it's it's Cthulhu again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had. What else did I have here? Oh, this this one's up you guys' alley. Uh, Earth is suddenly rotating faster. Oh, no. Uh-oh. And the shortest day has just been recorded. All right. Uh, 2020 had the had the 28th shortest day since 1960. Huh. The shortest day in 2021 was longer than it was in 2020, reversing the trend from the previous year. But on June 29th, 2022... Our planet made its fastest ever rotation, and on uh, July 26, 2022, there was a day that lasted 1.50 milliseconds less, apparently. Wow. And they have no idea why. Their their ideas are, um, some have postulated that less weight on the poles results from the, resulting from the melting of the glaciers. Others note that the molten core of our planet's interior is moving over time. Seismic activity could be another related cause. Yet others surmise that the movement of the Earth's geographic poles across its surface, known as the Chandler wobble, may be what's happening. Hmm. I would uh, I would imagine that the um, that the moon's proximity to the Earth would have some effect on this because yeah, it uh, it causes it to bulge. So yeah. if the bulge is not as much, it's going to spin faster, right? It's conservation of yep. angular momentum. And where, and where all the planets are, and there's a whole bunch of stuff probably that affects it. Well, there's a lot of cosmic stuff, too, that they paid no attention to. Yeah. Like, like we act like the Earth is kind of like its own little system. Yeah, closed, react- closed system. Yeah. yeah. Spin like it up real fast, and then we can build giant pyramids with huge blocks, and then we can <laughs> slow it back down. <laughs> Wasn't that someone's theory? I don't know. I think Jesus Gamara thinks that uh, there was less gravity a long time ago. Well, I think someone, but I think someone had postulated the idea that the the pyramids around the world were some kind of balancing mechanism. to no. to steady the Earth or something. Yeah, steady the wobble. Yeah. That's yeah, not, that's, it's not enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, Put it, yeah, I mean, putting a speck of of sand on your wheel to to balance it. Yeah. I mean, I've heard repeatedly, and I don't, I haven't sourced out the data that uh, the all the planets in the solar system are heating up currently. Yeah, I've heard that too. And I, I don't know if that's completely true. I've heard it enough that that there seems to be some source to it. Um, but again, if if that's the case, and there's something affecting the solar system from outside. Yeah. If, who knows what other cycles we're in that we just, you know, we could be passing through some kind of cosmic something that, that causes, you know, more heat to be created. Yeah. Yeah. Our, and our, probably our star is a lot more variable than than we've thought. You know, oh, yeah. That, that science has thought. I think uh, uh, that's probably going to be a big part of it. I, I don't see a reason why a star should be extremely stable over a long period of time. Uh, we we know that our weather on the pla- on on Earth has just it, it has craziness built into it, mm-hmm. uh, and it's really complicated. Um, you know, it's it's a very complex mechanism. So the sun probably has similar mechanisms that we just have no way of understanding. So, and who knows what's going on inside of it? Right, right. It's and, hollow. And the, thing- <laughs> the hollow sun. 
Well, I mean, the 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 electric universe postulates that it kind of is hollow. Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And and so if they're right, and it's more like a, a giant light bulb, where most of it's 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 outer surface, and that's and we know it's cooler inside than the outside, just like a light bulb. Yeah, I think are, you're talking about with the sunspots that we see it. it they're a, basically a hole through the. Um, through the surface and they look they appear to be cooler down there than they are than the surface is. Yeah. Well yeah. we've been able to measure below the surface and the temperature below the surface is less than on the surface. The the surface of the sun is way hotter than the inside. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's... doesn't make sense for a controlled nuclear explosion that's been going on for billions of years. <laughs> Yeah, it is strange. And that I'm pretty sure that that data comes from looking at the sunspots where yeah. the, the I think so, yeah. 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 There's the something cuz the only way to see through the surface of the sun is to look down into a sunspot. And so there's some kind of uh there's some kind of reaction there. Whatever it is, they the sunspots are are holes in the surface and it is cooler inside them than it is on the surface elsewhere. So sure. strange. Yeah. So, I mean, who and like I said, who knows what other cycles were involved in? Yeah. You know, we have we have the great year, which, you know, may be rotation around another center of gravity with another star. And beyond that, I mean, who knows what else there is? We're moving up and down the plane of the ecliptic to the to the center of the Milky Way. So we could be moving through anything that, you know, we're just not even aware is there. Yep. Yeah. And, and it I seems like I think we're in uh, a the. The last time I was reading about this, you know, the, the basically the, the location of the solar system in the galaxy, we're in something called the local bubble. Um, but we're, I think we're supposed to be moving out of it. And the local bubble is supposed to be a kind of a, a sort of a clear area in the, what you would think of as just the galactic stuff, the dust and the gas. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a bubble that was caused by a very old supernova. Um, so the supernova pushed all the stuff outward. So we've been moving through this relatively open and clear area for a long time, and we're moving back into the more dusty, you know, gaseous material, which would just cause friction just by itself. Yeah. So, which could cause heating of the outer planets and stuff, and frogs to fall. Frogs <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> well, that's just a glitch in the matrix. <laughs> and I mean, the thing about that is that. That would be an explanation. So if we were in a, you know, if we were in a virtual reality, a glitch could entirely cause that. Oh yeah, absolutely. Or, or it's, it's or it's, out it's programmed in. You know, that was yeah. a, my my favorite idea is that that there's just a system, and I think Fort talked about this too. That there's a system, and its job is to occasionally rain life onto the planet. Uh, you know. And it's probably always doing it with microbes and viruses and stuff like that. Oh, yeah. But yeah, occasionally yeah. you get frogs and fish and worms. Uh, Dude, there's, some, there's something up with frogs because not only do they rain from the sky, but they're occasionally found in like million-year-old coal, ve coal veins. Yes, that's, that's, that's what I'm saying. So sometimes <laughs> the, the system is, is kind of broken, right? <laughs> and it's, it tries to rain frogs where there used to be a swamp, but now there's a mountain. This is a bad spawning location. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one, one of the articles I had grabbed for tonight, or for at some point, uh, came from uh, Anomalalian. It says, our universe is most likely flat, astrophysicists say. Uh, yes, I saw this. Flat, flat universe, flat people. Universe. <laughs> and I mean, they, they, they basically suggest there's three likely scenarios that, that either it's um, closed, open, and flat. Uh, so the closed universe is finite in size, and due to its curvature, traveling far enough in one direction will lead back to the starting point. Open and flat universes are infinite, and traveling in a constant direction will never lead back to the same point, although they speculate that a flat universe could be like a Mobius strip. Yeah. yeah. So, that, so that you might eventually end up back in the same spot. Yep. But again, we're looking at all this stuff from our tiny little viewpoint in space. And like, it, it, it's such a small vantage point. And we're also, I just, I've always wondered how, you know, when you, when you do experiments 
for example, how you know how many how many times have we heard uh, something like uh, you know radio telescope scientists were they thought they picked something up, but then it turned out that somebody was just microwaving their casserole in the cafeteria <laughs> nearby, right? So you right. don't so you don't you don't want to do your very delicate experiments next to another powerful source of energy. And we're sitting yes. next to this star. Uh, <laughs> however, whether it's thermonuclear or totally electromagnetic, it doesn't matter. It's a seriously no. powerful source of energy. And I feel like uh, I feel like if we could ever get out of its away from its influence into actually interstellar space, we might find out some more interesting things. And then, you know, you may ha even have to eventually using the stuff you figured out out there, get outside of the galaxy's influence to really learn the real fundamental basics about how space works. Yeah. And, you know, when you see these pictures, like from the new telescope, which have just enhanced what we already had that was mind-boggling. Yeah. You know, to make any assumptions about our, our universe is just... Right. <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, yeah, all this just exploded from a single singularity. Yeah. We can't even conceive of the size of our solar system, much less the size of our galaxy. And then we're looking at pinpricks that are entire other galaxies. Yeah. I loved the simulation jokes about that, that that we we were going to strain the CPU that was running the simulation by looking because, you know, you, it doesn't have to like render that stuff as long as you're not. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but if we keep building better and better telescopes, we're going to strain the uh, the simulation by making it render more and more yeah. detail. And it's going to start raining frogs a That's lot right. more often. It's gonna, <laughs> stuff's going to start really going wrong. <laughs> So what were they doing back in the 1800s that was causing all these things to go wrong? It's <laughs> mm. an interesting question. Yeah. Um, I had another one here. Where the hell did I, where I have did a we... I have a story that kind of pulls us back to cryptids and how we interpret things. Okay. Um, so people probably know about Homo floresiensis. This is the hobbit. Uh, yeah. And remember that... Um, a couple of things I'll say before we start this article. This is really cool, actually. It's it's an opinion piece. Uh, it's from the-scientist.com, which is a website for a magazine. But uh, this is be this is being written by an author. He wrote a book uh, where he was doing research on this. Um, but what I want to say is that number one, the dis the 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 discovery of this hominid really was it rocked the scientific world. Like it, this was this was this blew their minds that this was possible, yeah. number one. And number two, they were looking at fossil evidence and they were thinking it was 20, 30, 40,000 years old, right? That this, right. that these species died out. So this, this is called another species of hominin may still be alive. In 2004, the scientific world was shaken by the discovery of fossils from a tiny species of hominin on the Indonesian island of Flores, labeled Homo floresiensis, and dating to the late Pleistocene, the species was apparently a contemporary of early modern humans in this part of Southeast Asia. Yet in certain respects, the diminutive hominin resembled Australopithecines and even chimpanzees. Twenty years previously, says the author, when I began ethnographic fieldwork on Flores, I heard tales of human-like creatures, some still reputedly alive, although very rarely seen. In the words of the H. Floresiensis Discovery Team's leader, the late Mike Morwood, last at the University of Wollongong in Australia, descriptions of these hominids fitted Floresiensis 2AT. So in other words, the, the descriptions of the locals that they were saying, we have seen these things, fitted what they thought Floresiensis looked like exactly. So not least because the newly described fossil species was as assumed to be extinct, I began looking for ways this remarkable resemblance might be explained, and the result is a book called Between Ape and Human. Coming from a professional anthropologist and ethnobiologist, my conclusions will probably surprise many. They might be even more startling than the discovery of H. floresiensis, which was once described by paleoanthropologist Peter Brown of the University of New England as tantamount to the discovery of a space alien. Unlike other books concerned with hominid evolution, the focus of my book is not on fossils, but on a local human population called the Leo and what these people say about an animal, as they describe it, that is remarkably like a human, but is not human. Something I can only call an ape man. 
My aim in writing the book was to find the best explanation, that is, the most rational and empirically best supported, of Leo accounts of these creatures. These include reports of sightings by more than 30 eyewitnesses, all of whom I spoke with directly, and I conclude that the best way to explain what they told me is that a non-sapiens hominid has survived on Flores to the present or very recent times. Between Ape and Human also considers general questions, including how natural scientists construct knowledge about living things. One issue is the relative value of various sources of information about creatures, including animals undocumented or yet to be documented in the scientific literature, and especially information provided by traditionally non-literate and technologically simple communities such as the Leo, a people who 40 or 50 years ago anthropologists would have called primitive. To be sure, the Leo don't have anything akin to modern evolutionary theory with speciation driven by mutation and natural selection. But if evolutionism is fundamentally concerned with how different species arose and how differences are maintained, then Leo people and other Flores Islanders have for a long time been asking these same questions. Leo folk zoology and cosmology also include stories of natural beings, specifically humans, transforming permanently into animals of other kinds. And they do this in part by moving into new environments and adopting new ways of life, thus suggesting a qualified Lamarckism. So that's so basically he's saying that they their their idea of what happens sometimes is that humans can degrade into animalistic forms mm. rather than what modern science thinks of as animalistic forms have to evolve into more advanced ones like humans. And Lamarckism, I think, is basically a nod to, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, epigenetics, where, where acquired traits during a lifetime can be passed on to offspring. Right. So this is how you could, a human population to, could degrade into an animalistic thing. You go somewhere, you acquire traits that make you more animalistic, that makes your kids more animalistic, and so on and so forth. So this guy says, As my fieldwork revealed, such posited changes reflect local observations of similarities and differences between a supposed ancestral species and its differentiated descendants. Like the majority of named categories in Leo animal classification, these derivatives coincide with the species or genera of modern systematics. At the same time, Leo distinguish humans from non-human animals in much the same way as do modern Westerners. That is, not just on morphological grounds, but by attributing complex expressions of culture, language, and technology exclusively to humans. Like other folk zoologists, the Leo put humans first, most notably as the origin of non-human animals, a sort of Darwinism in reverse. And in contrast, evolutionary theory puts humans or hominids last, just as does the biblical story of Genesis. Yet in all instances, the position confers on Homo sapiens a unique status, thereby separating us from the rest of the animal kingdom. For the Leo, the ape man's appearance as something incompletely human makes the creature anomalous and hence problematic and disturbing. For academic scientists, H. floresiensis is similarly pr problematic, but not so much for its resemblance to H. sapiens, but rather it's because the species appears very late in the geological record, surviving to a time well after the appearance of modern humans. Whether H. floresiensis would have been any harder or easier to accept had it been interpreted as a bipedal ape rather than a species of human is difficult to say. Nevertheless, it's interesting that Morewood, taking an implicitly unilinear view of hominin evolution and arguing for the species' inclusion in Homo spoke of the evidence that the diminutive hominin walked the earth relatively recently as one good reason to classify H. floresiensis in our genus. For this can only mean that, in the view of this author, what survives until recent time, re until recent times has to somehow belong with us. As for the ape men, the Leo classify them or identify them as animals. In fact, they are one of several animals that Leo people claim descended from humans. But this classification has nothing to do with geological dating or any paleoanthropological evidence. Instead, the Leo people who distinguish natural from supernatural beings in essentially the same way religious Westerners do, interpret ape men as non-human animals with reference to observable features that clearly separate them from invisible spirits, from other more familiar animals, and of course, from people. Some features of the ape men might suggest a scientifically undiscovered species or population of modern apes, but 
Leo's statements mostly count against this hypothesis, as does all we know about the biogeography of eastern Indonesia. Our initial instinct, I suspect, is to regard the extant ape men of Flores as completely imaginary. But, taking seriously what Leo people say, I've found no good reason to think this. What they say about the creatures, supplemented by other sorts of evidence, is fully consistent with a surviving hominid species, or one that only went extinct within the last 100 years. Paleoanthropologists and other life scientists would do well to incorporate such indigenous knowledge into continuing investigations of hominid evolution in Indonesia and elsewhere. He says, for reasons, I dis- for reasons I discuss in the book, no field zoologist is yet looking for living species of H. floresiensis or related hominid species, but this does not mean they cannot be found. And how, how does this connect, I wonder, into Bigfoot? Yeah, that's yeah. what uh, this is kind of what I was getting at is is here we have an example of a possible the possible current or extant existence of an unknown hominid living alongside of humans for a long time. There's indigenous wisdom and knowledge about them. It's mostly being ignored by modern scientists, even though at this point the modern scientists now agree that such a thing did exist at one point in the past. Right. So this guy has has stuck his neck out and said, well, look, I talked to these people and, you know, he's a, what did he say? He's an anthropologist and an ethnobiologist. And he's like, I don't see any reason why we should ignore their accounts when their descriptions of this fossil evidence we found fits it. It fits. And these people are saying, no, they still, they're still around, or at least they were very, until very recently. So he spoke to people who had witnessed them. Yeah. So yeah, I- if Bigfoot, you know, little people... Uh, the idea that there can be a population of human-like beings living in deep forests or in jungles or, you know, uh, in remote areas and are still encountered occasionally by regular people is, I think, is really strengthened by this entire argument and this whole, this, um, this whole discovery. Yeah. Well, I mean, when they did the the... They were looking for Bigfoot, I think, down in India, and they, they discovered that there was an undiscovered bear species there. Yep. You know, from the hair samples. I mean, they didn't find Bigfoot, but I mean, still, they found something that, that you know, they act like, well, we've, we've discovered all the, the major big <laughs> life on the planet. Right, but yeah. yeah. Keep finding more. Yeah. Yeah, that the only thing left to discover is, like, bugs, you know, yeah. and maybe some plants. And maybe some small things in the ocean, but it's it's not it's not true. <laughs> I just I really like the idea of hybridization too. I mean, you I I feel yeah. like you have to include hybridization into the evolutionary model, yep. and that that could produce uh, what would seem like to humans uh, the a degradation, or as you put it, like yeah, you know. I'm not suggesting people go try this for science, but I mean, <laughs> do it for science. <laughs> people like, you know, humans mating with other animals could possibly produce hybrids that d- are somewhere between or yep. completely outside of the, um, you know, the traits of the two beings. Yep. So you see this in, in hybrid animals where two anim- two different species of animal can hybridize and produce uh, another species that has traits that are um, outside of the two combined traits. Like, say, take size, for example. Was it, is it the liger that's huge? It's bigger than both parents? The, yeah. The, the lion and the tiger? There's one of them that, where there's a known, there's a known trait that it, it is out, far out beyond the, either, the traits of either right. of the parent species. So you can produce giants yeah. from, from two animals that are not giants. Right. Right, and you can produce, you know, uh, like so dwarves or the you yeah. Know, what do you what do you call it the the hobbits hobbits from, yeah. from two species that are larger. Right, and what's interesting about that kind of thing is that any trait can do that. You know, in this case, we're talking about size, but it can be any trait can have something that is far outside of the of of the the traits of the parent species. The question is, is how far out. You know how far apart in in speciation can something hybridize? And you know there are some but, indications that it can be far apart. Again, being you know considering like the intermediatist way of looking at it, right? You have two fairly close together species that then produce something like much 
seemingly outside yeah. their normal traits, then that thing can reproduce with back something breed. else. Well, backbreed with the with this with its parent species, or also breed with something else that's a little closer to what it is like. Yeah, that's and right. And that keeps going over time. And and so yeah, you you find a new species of bear, and it's like, oh wow, was that has that bear been around? for hundreds of thousands of years or did it just show up yeah 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 that's a very good point yep so i know you guys usually like to take breaks do you want to take a break now and then do the other hour yeah, sure sure yeah okay that's a great idea that's a fantastic <laughs> idea soraya let's take a break <laughs> We are back from the break. It is Brothers of the Serpent and Where Did the Road Go? We are joined by Soraya. We're doing a swap cast this episode. So thanks all of you from Where Did the Road Go listenership and from the Brothers of the Serpent listenership. And we're continuing our conversation. We're going through news stories and just whatever else comes to our mind. Oh, I had one uh, one here I pulled up uh, that says, uh, this is from futurism.com. Scientists say we may be extremely wrong about the universe. <laughs> Oh, no. Uh Uh-oh. It's about time they figured that out. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Uh, It says, not to alarm anyone, but several scientists are saying we need to revamp our entire understanding of the universe. Instead of a uniformly expanding cosmos that looks more or less the same anywhere you go, some experts are now positing that the whole universe is actually skewed with profound implications for our understanding of the natural world. Mm. Subir Sarkar, a professor at the University of Oxford, tells new scientists that he's discovered evidence suggesting that our current understanding of cosmology is broken. Uh, we are very, we are in a very unenviable unev- position in that most of our colleagues don't even want to hear about this. Yes. The idea that the cosmos looks largely the same no matter where you go is, uh, is called the cosmological principle, and it's been around in some form or another since the 1500s. Now, though, scientists like Sarker say the way, that we, the way our own Milky Way moves through the universe could be interfering with our understanding of the rest. Mm. Sarker told new scientists that our relatively small number of known galaxies and the inability to know exactly how far apart they are leaves room to speculate. When a single animal slows down in a large herd, it looks like all the others are running away from it at a fast pace. In much the same way, it's possible that Earth only seems as if the universe is expanding at a given rate. Sarkar isn't the first to suggest our current models and rules for the cosmos don't exactly work. In 2020, new scientists also reported that the universe appeared to be expanding so much more quickly than we thought and was incompatible with the accepted model of physics. In 2021, Alexi... Alexia Lopez of the University of Central Lancaster found a giant line of galaxies that broke rules and theories, too. Sarkar says that our current theories about the universe might be broken would be a massive would mean a massive overhaul of existing theory. Many aren't willing to accept right now. But if there's one thing we know for sure, it's that our understanding of the natural world frequently looks wrong in retrospect. Yes. Hmm. Uh, so it's nice to see that on things like New Scientist. Yes. Yep. What was that story that you had read the other day about the gravity? Yeah, so the uh, gravity or the black hole idea? No, uh, the, the gravity that it get, that as it gets weaker, it actually has oh, a different yeah, effect. Oh, yeah, yeah. So there's a um, – this guy has a, has a theory – and it's basically he's he's taking a new look at the possibility of uh, dark matter just being a phenomenon of gravity itself as opposed to some material material that we can't see. And the gist of the the theory was that what if very weak gravity does something different than in in, in extreme strong like in other words that there's some kind of threshold that once you get to a certain level, then it it starts to act differently. Yeah. Um, 
so he's been basically using this this model to uh, run the model on observations and to predict, uh, I think it might have been the speeds at which these stars and other things might be moving yep, or something like that, or the redshift or this yeah, or that. Yeah, it was the speed. So he, he basically, it's not, it isn't, it isn't too specific in what's going on, but he's just saying there is a mathematical model uh, that uses this idea that actually works a lot better because, at predicting yeah, right. the speeds of objects in other galaxies than the current accepted model does. Uh, the current he, accepted model gives a a range, right, of the, the speeds or something, and the range is very broad, and of course what we actually observe falls within that range. But then using his model, the range is much narrower, and it's and what we actually observe is, still falls within that range. So it's like, well, this seems to be better at predicting more precisely what's going on. Yeah. But it's but the mathematical model, the way it's constructed, implies that something happens to gravity when it gets very weak. In other words, objects at the at the distant edges of galaxies are acting differently uh, based on the way gravity changes, and that this model explains it. And so, uh, or it doesn't explain it, but it actually predicts it. And so this it it may implies th that something is in something interesting is happening with gravity, not that there's. A, a halo of dark matter around the galaxies controlling the speeds of these objects out there. Hey, have you guys ever heard of the electric universe? Because <laughs> <laughs> it explains all this stuff. <laughs> it's just interesting. Yeah, it's just interesting that this mathematical model does it too. Because you know, when you look at when you look at how how what our understanding of gravity is, which all it is is math. Yeah. There is no oh, yeah. there's no mechanism. For yep. understanding the workings of gravity, really, there's some ideas on possible mechanisms, but none of them have been accepted. Right? Does does the electric universe model exclude the force of gravity? Like there is no force of gravity? No, it's it's just that they treat gravity as a weak force. So gravity isn't the thing holding the solar system together. That's electrical charge. It's just so much. Yeah, it's it's hard to. Hard to understand that because it's it's so much stronger. Like it's so ridiculously more powerful than gravity. Yeah. The um, and they've been able to. That's one of the interesting things in the lab. They can create mini galaxies, and they form just like the stuff we're seeing in the larger, you know, universe. They form into spiral arm galaxies and stuff like that, all done with electrical current. Yeah. Yeah, and their their big thing is that you know the standard model is literally all math and no actual reality. Yes, when it comes to cosmology, I can agree with that. Yes, it's it's. I mean, there is there's our observations, right? That we have that that we have, and you right. have to try to explain that with, you know, uh, air quotes known phenomena which we can observe and do experiments on down here. Uh, and that works pretty well. I mean, it, it does work well. It doesn't explain everything though. Right. Yeah. Right. One of the, one of the great quotes from the, um, the Feynman lectures we just went through the character physical law, he quoted Newton, uh, you know, when Newton first presented his laws of gravitation, that people were saying, well, this doesn't explain anything. It doesn't tell us, you know, why this, why this happens. And he says, I've told you how it moves, <laughs> not why. Right. Yeah. Which is, which is that that's still the case today. You know, it's the, 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 even with the adjustments by relativity and all that stuff, cause the, you know, the idea, the math for, for calculating gravity has changed a little bit, but it's still about how things move, not why they move that way. Yes. Yeah. And I mean, it works well enough for us to send probes to other planets and so on and so forth. Yes. So it's it's not that it's completely wrong. It's that they're leaving out the electrical component. Yeah. It just could like, be, it just could... like the EU isn't, none of this is ever going to be 100%. We're never going to know it perfectly. Right. Right. And it's it's just, it's it's interesting how something so seemingly fundamental as the force of gravity can still yet to have any kind of 
uh, mechanistic or not mechanistic, but mechanical explanation, you know, like, well, what are the, what is the thing that makes it do this? Yeah. Whereas electricity is different. Like they can look at the particles and they can see what's going on and they can kind of have somewhat of a theory of what, what's yeah. causing the, the electrical charge or whatever. Yeah. But yes, what Kyle was saying, the differences in the strengths of those two forces is enormous. Uh, Feynman was pointing out that the difference in the strength between the electrical force and the force of gravity is close to the difference between the sizes of the entire known universe in 1964 and a proton. So that's a really big difference. <laughs> Yeah, and his point about it was it's it's so vastly different that they don't really have anything else to compare it to. Other, that's like the best way they can give you a comparison. Yeah. Is the entire universe compared to the size of a proton. And it's that's it's not quite right, but it's you know, there's nothing in other words, he he says that people are looking for some other massive number like that. Yeah. But I guess it hasn't been found. So yeah, I just I I I like the uh, the idea, like the electric universe idea that uh, electricity or the you know that that force is playing a much bigger role than is yep. than is especially when you get into these these gigantic sizes like these these macro structures in the universe, galaxy clusters, and all this kind of stuff. What you know. Er, and then you zoom in and you, you know, all these stars are, are, they have huge, uh, electromagnetic fields and there's all this stuff. And then you, so yeah, you can imagine like, does this on these really large scales, what is that force really doing? Yeah. You know, it, I don't know. I, I, I like that idea, but you still have to, if, if they accept that there is a gravitational force, then, I mean, it's doing something too, right? Right. Just oh, definitely. Yes. Um, I was trying to find a, a uh, like a concise explanation of the electric universe theory of gravity. Um, and the best I found is what is the electric universe theory, which just says the electric universe theory, EU, generally states that electricity is the engine behind a long natural long list of natural and astrophysical spectacles. It supports the idea that electricity powers the sun and stars and that cosmic occurrences are electrical in nature. The theory also suggests that the universe is a vast electric organism, chock full of yet to be discovered masses, holes, relationships, and phenomena. EU advocates believe that we are at the beginning of exploring the possibilities around this concept. Since the first pamphlet was distributed in 1983, there have been many papers, books, and theses published on the electric universe theory. While some of the tenets of the theory appear to be difficult to prove, the idea that the there is electricity throughout the universe and within every animal, plant, and elsewhere we find plasma is undeniable. The subterranean electricity, known as telluric currents, to atmospheric electricity, for example, meteors, and from extraterrestrial or cosmic electricity to electrostatic phenomena, electrical currents are visible and or audible. All these things result from the interaction between electrical currents, filaments, atmospheres, and formations of matter. Yep. It says the EU has been proven, disproven, celebrated, and dismissed throughout the past 125 years, and since Tesla disappeared from planet Earth. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't want to go too far into the electric universe, but are they basically saying that meteors are really lightning bolts? I mean, are we going, is this no, going no, no. back to no. that? <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're, they're saying the re it's not just heat that you're getting when they come in, but that yeah, you're getting you're electrical getting, discharges. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and especially with comets, they they talk about you know because the theory is well, comets are discharging gases and stuff as they heat up, but they're saying that's not what's happening. What you're getting is an electrical charge as the comet enters in further into the the uh, the sun's electrical field. Yeah. Yeah. And it does that does actually match up. And one of the things that they said, uh, Walt Thornhill predicted that when they landed a probe on a comet, that there would be a massive electrical discharge. And so when they landed the first probe on a comet, there was this blinding flash. Yeah. And the standard model people were like, oh, that was just a glitch. <laughs> 
And Walt for some reason, that I mean, that doesn't. That's not surprising to me. I, I don't know why that is is controversial. I guess it's not surprising that there was an electrical that discharge. That, 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 yeah, that they're going to have different electrical potentials. Or it's not surprising that they were like it's just a glitch. Neither one. Both of those things are not surprising, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's well, and the, I mean, even even in the standard model of how stars work. Electri uh, electrical force, electromagnetic force is a huge player in yeah. in the oh, way yeah. it works, you know? So the idea that the sun is a, an enormous electromagnetic body is not completely out That's of the... That's not controversial. It's not yeah. controversial, you know? It's just that the, the standard model does think of uh, fusion as being the underlying driving force. But, right. but the temperatures are supposed to be high enough to where all the electrons in the in the atoms in the sun in, in any in any star are basically free flowing so they create massive amounts of electromagnetic force and that's what solar flares are and cmes are caused by and you know the entire surface of the sun that we see is basically run by electromagnetic force but yeah the the, the standard model just says that the whole thing is powered by uh the heat from fusion right right so i don't I, i'm i've never been really sure that you know that you could you can't really separate the two it's possible that it's really both of them are happening and that maybe if you wanted to say well the, the source of the power really is the electromagnetic force and the fusion is a secondary effect well that's you know that's also possible yeah i don't think we know enough about the sun to be able to tell right yeah i mean the prediction the thing about the eu is that their predictions are generally dead on you know, like like even Velikovsky, when Laird did his book, which you guys covered. Yep. You know, he showed that almost everything Velikovsky said has been proven by science in the last, what, 120 years? Or, or not disproven by right. further experiments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yet no one no one in mainstream science will take Velikovsky seriously. Well, you can't. That's a career killer to do exactly. that. Exactly. Yeah. Speaking of Velikovsky, we got a we got a great comment from one of our listeners, the Mad Fiddler. Oh yeah, uh, and he he was listening to. Um, let's see, uh, I guess he was listening to the Hidden History of the Human Race yep. book. But anyway, it goes off on this thing because there's a. I, I think I did a news story there where there's these two giant globs that they've been studying that are down on, in the mantle of the Earth. Oh yeah, you know these these two incredibly massive, dense objects that are outside of the core, but just sort of floating around in the mantle in certain places of the earth mm. and combining that with, you know, the standard model of the earth's moon formation, which one of the ideas is that we were hit by some object from outer space that blew out this giant piece of the earth that, yeah, that then right. coalesced. And so he's pointing out Matt, uh, the mad fiddler here is pointing out that, uh, this is the, the standard model is that there was an impact, something was ejected from the planet, and then it became a regular orbit yeah. around the Earth. Yeah. And that is our moon. Right. But then when Velikovsky Venus, says Venus couldn't have done that. No, yeah. <laughs> there's no way. That's what they say. There's no way that something could hit Jupiter and eject a giant piece of the planet out, and then it would have a regular orbit around the sun. <laughs> right. That's just not well, possible. It's not well. possible. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great comment. I was, I was like, yes, that's so. And even if it did, you know, even if it didn't come from Jupiter, um, you know, still there, there's evidence that Venus is a newcomer to the solar system. Right. You know, even taking that out and saying, okay, maybe maybe that was that part was wrong. I mean, it's still all the stuff Velikovsky predicted we would find out about Venus all turned out to be true. Yeah. The, I, I think the main problem people have is with the timeline of these events. You know, the moon thing yeah. is is safely four billion years in the past or whatever. Yeah. 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 Uh, but Venus doing this 6,000 years ago or 4,000 years ago or whatever is that's just too recent. This is this is something that this is something that uh, you see a lot, and it seems like you see a lot in the in the in the standard views is that all these giant, massively catastrophic events are so far into the distant past that they're safely, you know, that you can really just say, well, this is how something formed, but it happened so long ago, and it's not something that happens now, or recently, or that anybody could possibly have seen and written about. Yeah, yeah. And yet, you do have 
I know at least that there are certain, uh, you know, Native American tribes and other people who have said that they talk about a time before the moon, whatever that yep. means, you know, and that there's yeah, there's some implications in other ancient sources that there was a time before Venus, or at least when Venus was a lot more irregular than it is now. Yes. So, oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's, that's you know, one of the things that Laird looked at. He's like, yes. okay, since Velikovsky's time, let's see. And no, there is no record of Venus before certain points, and all those records suggest it's a comet. Yeah. And, you know, going back to Fort, he was recording about the problem with eclipses, you know, and how there were, there, there were people that, or there's records, ancient records of eclipses from people who otherwise recorded their astronomical observations very accurately. Yes. Who seem to have recorded eclipses that couldn't possibly have happened according to our current models. Right. And uh, whatchamacallit talks about that too, uh, Laird. Yeah. So does uh, Scott, uh, Scott Crichton. Because he's suggesting a, a pole shift, like a full like reversal uh, that, that happens and then, and then uh, reverses itself again a, a certain point later. And the stuff he put together in his last book, uh, the the Secret Chamber of the Pyramid, whatever it's called, um, was really interesting. Because initially I'm going into it going, I don't know about the pole shift thing. But then as he's presenting the evidence of like the the accounts in Egypt where they say the sun rose in the west and set set in the east and all this other stuff. And then he's showing alignments on certain monuments toward the west for this same time period. And it's kind of like, huh, that's compelling. Yeah. So a geographic pole shift, not a not a magnetic pole shift. Right. Yeah. Right. Like the, the the like the planet literally flipped over. Yeah. It's hard to understand how something that catastrophic could happen and anything could survive. But you know, life will find a way. I'm just saying it's just it's difficult to understand well, his, how his theory didn't have it just flipping over overnight. Right. It, it wouldn't happen overnight for sure. So he had it broken down where, yes, there were some disasters and stuff, but it wasn't enough to destroy, the, you know, all life on Earth or anything. But what would the water do? That's my biggest problem. I feel like oceans yeah. would just roll over the continents. Even I mean, that's a, you're, you're having to change the, you know, the, the, the movement the of all that water and it's going to slosh. And I just, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just I'm not sure how anything could survive. Maybe but the fish are still raining out of the sky from when that happened. That's what you have to think of it like this too. If you if you think of the 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 path of least resistance concept, right? If the whole crust of the entire planet flips over, that was the path of least resistance. That's, so that's where true. That's true. where does this re massive resistance come from that would not allow it to continue in its current inertial state? You're right. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's okay. uh, it's it is hard to imagine what force. That's what, yeah, that's why Velik Velikovsky that. was saying it has to be an outside body. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The yeah. only force that we know I of. I love that, these ideas. Yeah, the I only think. force that we know of that could do that is the close passage of another massive body. Could be electricity, bro. Or it could be electricity, yeah. Um, <laughs> when I talked to Robert Schock about this at one point, uh, Schock <clears throat> really likes the electric universe idea. Um, he did not like their timeline for Venus, and he said he thinks if the Venus thing happened and we had these close, it was probably the event that caused the electrical outbursts at the end of the Younger Dryas. Right. And that, you know, that that's, I think that's still too recent for almost everybody in the scientific community, but still that makes it more understandable for me. And you can still see how those stories could survive into the modern time. Yes. Uh, carried forth just like so many other <coughs> cat catastrophe stories have you know it's well and it, and it would have taken thousands of years for venus to finally you know s even uh in an electrical model it would take a while before venus finally you know settles down into a regular orbit yeah but if you think about it so if if venus was created let's let's say venus came out of jupiter it would have come out with lots of cometary debris it wouldn't have been a single piece. Sure. So you have the uh, the first event that started the Younger Dryas, which was almost certainly cometary. 
And then you have the close approach of something larger that may have ended it by unleashing, you know, basically thunderbolts across the earth. And those thunderbolts, those plasma formations are recorded in most ancient cultures. We just didn't recognize them for what they were. Yeah. You know, everything from stuff in India to the Rangu Rangu script of uh, Easter Island. Yeah. That's and right. The only, and the only plasma formations not recorded are the ones that people couldn't survive if they saw. Right. Yeah, those are all very interesting. Or maybe they and... died while writing it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of scary when you think about it that you could have these plasma outbursts that could just basically incinerate you. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, the northern lights look all nice and stuff, but. Uh... Right. Yeah, they're benign. Sort <laughs> of. that up by a billion. Yeah. And there's still, you know, there's still sort of. Uh, it's interesting how people will tell you not to look at them too long, you know, that it can be bad. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not. It's sort of a folk, folksy thing, you know, don't stare at them, burn your yeah. eyes out, you know. Well, maybe dangerous. That comes from something. Yeah. Yep. That's interesting. I've never heard that. Yeah, I've read it, read it in a couple of different places. It's not anything that's, you know, it's sort of like throwing salt over your shoulder kind of yeah, a superstition. Yeah, but it comes but, from something. Yeah, it There's comes from reason, somewhere. Yes, know? yeah. Yeah. I just wish mainstream science was a little more open to looking at alternative ideas rather than only trying to prove its ideas. Yep. I agree with that. I going back to Feynman too is that we we did this recent series on Feynman's work, um, but he was basically saying that as he's going through the history of discovery, um, all these you know brilliant people who worked on models and stuff they 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 come up with some idea and they'd figure out all, they they develop this this model in their brain to explain some phenomenon. And that would ultimately, they would, in many cases, arrive at something true about what was going on. But it never had to do with the model itself. Like the model always ended up being wrong and useless. Yeah. And so I think, you know, with, what was it? It was Maxwell. Yeah, and he, he was actually trying to combine the electro and magnetic force. Right. So they had the electric yeah. force and they had magnetic forces and Maxwell's like trying to figure this out. And so he comes up with this model of all these wheels and pulleys and stuff going on and and figures out the, the Maxwell equations, basically, that combine the two forces. And that seems to be true, but the model is completely useless and definitely not happening. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so. his, ma his math is good, but the, yeah, but the, but the, you know, his mechanism is wrong. Yeah. So Feynman right. is just pointing out that, that over and over again, we use these models to give us an idea of like, okay, maybe this is how it's happening, but they always, so far they're all wrong. Yeah. But the, but you can, you can arrive at something that's, that matches our observations that is more mathematical or abstract. Yeah. It can be predictive, but not explanatory. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing about the, you know, the, the idea of trying to, trying to figure out like how plasma forms and thunderbolts and all this kind of stuff can do all of these things. It's, it's, it's an attempt to build this model. And I just don't know. You know, I'm just, I'm curious about that. Like, and also it, how the earth could roll over on its poles. It's the same thing. It's yeah. like, you know, what, what is really happening? What's actually going on? You know, we have this model in our head of like, well, how do you take something with that much inertia and and rotate it 180 degrees? You know, so all I think it's been a while since I read Crichton's book, but I think he's talking about the oldest pyramids were built to survive the flood for when the earth flipped. And he talks about them being used to store grain and, and other things that were needed to restart civilization. Hmm. Right down to saying that the because the there was an explosion in the Great Pyramid. Yeah. And he shows how grain could actually have caused that explosion. Yeah, I know it can it can it can explode sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I just have a hard time uh 
imagining the pyramid as being a place to store grain. It's it's so tortuous <laughs> as <laughs> yeah. Right? Going crawling around in, in it, you're just like, what the hell is this for? Yeah, yeah. Getting anything well, in there and then out again is a giant pain in the ass, including I, just I, yourself. I I do think that there was grain actually found in the chambers. Oh yeah, I wouldn't doubt it. It's so, just, but I it's mean, also been it's been used by later cultures over and over. Sure, so sure. it's just hard to understand. But that also suggests that he, you know, when you were talking about the oceans rolling over the land, that might have been. Yeah. Now part I can of what de- I can about. I can definitely see how you would. If you thought, all right, the water is going to just be rolling across the land in whatever for whatever reason, whether it's because the earth is flipping over or because there's going to be giant floods or impacts in the ocean or something, that you might build enormous structures like this to survive it. Or underground cities like yeah. But then again, I mean, we've been to the to the Scablands in, in eastern Washington, and you're looking at thousands of feet of solid rock that were just ripped out of the ground yeah. by water. Yeah. And so it's like, okay, you build a tiny... I mean, you could have ripped uh, probably thousands of the Great Pyramids just right, completely gone yeah. off the surface in, in the amount of water that was going through that place. Right. No but problem. It been, it and it's much harder rock, thing. too, that it was digging through. <laughs> yeah. But it might have been a different type of thing. You could have had a, a slower rise that the pyramids survived. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to say that there was never the water was never flowing past there. I'm just thinking of like trying to build something to survive a catastrophic flood. Yeah. Um, you got to build a bunch of them because you don't know which ones are going to be in the path. Right. Of the floodwaters. I'm just pointing out that a pyramid would not survive that path. That's right. At no, all. No, definitely not. Nothing would and survive those, it. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, they're, they're the only thing on earth that would have a chance and they wouldn't survive. Right. But if you build a three inch thick steel obelisk, <laughs> it's going to survive. Now, now he's making fun of a different story we read. <laughs> What's that? Uh, it was a story I found about people in modern times trying to build a. What did they call it? A, bla- a black or... box for the Earth. Yeah, and they're like, "We made it out of three. We made it out of three inch steel." And Kyle and I are already like, "Okay, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. Bye bye." <laughs> <laughs> and how long was it supposed to last? Well, it's supposed to. It seems like the goal is well. F- first of all, it's built. It's got all these assumptions built into it about what's going to destroy the Earth. Mm. Um. And of course, they're you know, but what the, their goal is like we put they're like we put solar panels on it so it can be powered even if the grid goes down, and its job is to record climate data and also like Twitter or something, <laughs> uh, because they're try what they're trying to do is tell f- the future people who survive the after post apocalyptic world apocalyptic world that climate change killed us all. Mm. So they're thinking it's going to be uh, you know a heat problem or a CO two problem. Uh, right, right. So it just, you know, it's going to be uh, that it, basically a three inch steel could survive it. <laughs> We're just like, no. <laughs> if you look at the catastrophes of the past, this is not yeah. how it takes place. <laughs> yeah. But the end of the story was pretty cool. They're like, they're like, the, the, the next question is, is how to inform the future people how to read the data that's inside of it. Because otherwise, they're just going to find a mysterious monolith out in the middle of nowhere, and we already know how that worked out. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, would you be referring to the Georgia Guidestones there? No, I think they were talking. I think I think they were actually referring to those weird metal monoliths that people were finding for a while. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. I thought they were referring but to. I, just I liked it because it's just like, yes, we have found lots of weird monoliths out in the middle of nowhere. But I'm pretty sure, sure that they were talking about those metal oh, okay. monoliths that were a fad for a little while, or whatever they yeah. were. Yeah, I mean, they were neat little things. Yeah, I mean, it's always good to inject some some mild mystery into things. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I uh, wish I remembered Scott's book better. It's been a couple of years, I think, since I've had him on. Again, I, I would highly recommend you guys talk to him at some point. Yeah, we need to do that. Well, there's a couple of the things I want to point out that Feynman said that were really interesting. Like one okay. of the things he talked about was inertia itself. And he's just, you know, he was just explaining like there's this thing, inertia, and no one knows why 
it works the way it does, and no one's even trying to explain it. You know, the fact that once you put an object in motion, it will just stay in motion forever. Right. And what what exactly is governing that behavior? I thought that was really interesting. And it's just like, it's a mystery that no one's even looking into. That's true. Because we just, we're just like, okay, that works. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it, there was a time when, you know, a guy was like trying to figure out well, is is this the case, you know, and he's rolling all these balls and stuff and down different inclined planes and yeah. it eventually arrives at this idea that like, OK, the only reason things stop moving is because there is some other force acting upon it yeah. to stop it. And that's that's very subtle in some cases. Like it, it can be obvious, like you hit a you hit a wall. Yeah. Right. That's that seems obvious. But it is it is a very subtle thing that we just take for granted now that's just because it's just so known right this is just yes, a known yeah. property of things in the universe and no one looks at it anymore it seems to try to figure out well what it, what yeah, is why going? should that be the case yeah huh and I it's never thought about that but you're totally right yeah there's so many things like that when you get down to the to these principles of the way things act in the universe it's like we can observe them and notice that this is what happens and this is the trend and this is the pattern, but there really is zero explanation of why these yeah. principles exist. Some of, the, some of the great other, you know, deep fundamental things he talked about were various symmetries. Well, that's what he called them, but basically like there's a symmetry of translation, which is the idea that, that something you do in one place can basically be done the same way. In, in other words, like if I was, if you and I were, throwing a ball back and forth in your front yard. And then we came to my house to do it in my front yard. Neither one of us would expect it to be very different. You know, maybe there's right. wind or whatever, but basically there's no expectation that because we've moved a, a large distance and we're doing this same activity in somewhere else that there's going to, that it's going to be totally completely different. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a symmetry of translation a symmetry of space that basically any experiment or action you do that you can take that experiment or action and move a small distance or an enormous distance and basically do the same thing. And it, it will turn out basically the same. Yeah. yeah. That, that space is symmetrical in that way. But we're, we're finding, you know, when we look out into the universe, that things aren't behaving the way we expect them. to. <laughs> That's right. right. Yeah. That, so know? how we're like, why is it doing that? Yeah. yeah. Right. How far does that symmetry go? Right. Yeah. We, it's and, and so you can look at it both ways. Like we we notice that when we're on one side of the sun in our orbit, we can do the experiment. And it's the same as when we were on the other side of the sun in the orbit. Yeah. Which is a long distance away in space. But so then we assume like, well, how far out can I grow this bubble and everything stays the same? And it's sort of kind of taken for granted that it's just the same. Yeah. But we are looking way out there, and there's all kinds of stuff going on that we're like, what the hell is that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, it and, is, it's cool to think. And going back to the simulation idea, I mean, that's how video games work. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then there's, a, there's, a, there's the, uh, the symmetry of, of time that an experiment you do now would have had the same results a million years ago. Right. Right. Or a million years from now. Uh. There was other interesting things that he talked about how from from the from the point of view of fundamental physics things are reversible in a way that they're actually not reversible which is really interesting like you know he said one of the ways that physicists will usually show this is they'll show a video of somebody dropping a cup of coffee and the cup falls down and shatters on the floor and the coffee goes everywhere and then they just play the video in reverse with the coffee and the cup coming back together forming into a thing and then flying up into the person's hand. And when you watch that video in reverse, you're like, ha, that's ridiculous. It would never happen. But he was pointing out that if a physicist was able to watch it on the atomic scale or even subatomic scale, that nothing impossible would take place in the reversed video. Right. So the right. question is, is why can't it be reversed in the real world when, when, you, when you look at the way the particles are acting and following the fundamental laws in the reverse video, it all works out. And that turned out to be about probabilities. And he, he kind of goes into a long thing of, you know, that, that stuff moves towards disorder rather than an order. 
Right. This right, is right. like the idea of entropy. Uh, so that but, was all. But, that was all very interesting as well. But there's also the chaos theory, which is that nothing is actually chaos. Yeah. You know, it looks like chaos because we can't see the order in it. Right. Yeah. There are questions about. There are questions about order and and disorder and the arrow of time. Uh, you know, and it, the idea that how can the universe be moving towards a state of disorderliness that implies that it had to start out being an orderly thing. Right. Uh, but the early universe does not look orderly at all, <laughs> you know? So it's, it's, the question is, is there, there are some paradoxes involved in this. Um, <laughs> the whole thing's a paradox. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, he also pointed out that the whole time symmetry, he was like, we have to agree that if you go back far enough in time and past the beginning of the universe, then the, then nothing, then it doesn't work out. And so, you know, there's the one free miracle idea. Yeah. You know, if yeah, we just yeah. ignore the start of the universe, then basically this all works and everything is symmetrical. <laughs> and he, he actually points that out and it's, it's great. This is one of the reasons why we love Feynman is that he, you know, he's basically a standard model, uh, I would say a pretty much a you know a mechanistic has a me mechanistic view of the universe and yet he's he's open to pointing out these deep mysteries. And in a lot of cases he's even though he's very mechanistic about his view of the universe he sees those deep mysteries much more clearly than his colleagues seem to. Well, I mean so much of that again it has to do with ego, it has to do with money. Um it has to do with dogma. I mean people like dogma. They really do. Yeah. You know, you like having that system you can you can count on to be there. Yes. That's you know, we right. all we, we all basically want to feel secure. And if you're a scientist who's tearing apart how the universe works, you still want to feel secure. <laughs> and you feel a lot more secure saying, Yeah, we basically understand all this than going, What the hell is going on? Yeah. Well, maybe I'm wired wrong. I feel very secure in saying we have no idea. Oh, so do I. So do I. <laughs> I. I think it's it's human nature, though, to want to feel secure, and that's part of the way we do that. Yeah. Okay. And I think that that's part of what happens when you get these people who call themselves skeptics. You know, that this stuff freaks them out. It makes them feel, you know, in less control. It lets it 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 threatens their security. Hmm. So they will say the most ridiculous stuff to explain it, as long as it fits into their view. Yeah. That's Which right. is also why why they're calling people who are who are against them names. That's true. Yep. One so. more one more symmetry I'll point out that he talked okay. about was the symmetry. What whether the universe can determine be uh, what was it? How did he put it? Was it, it was about uh, reflection? Is how he said it. A symmetry of reflection, but it really was about can you using fundamental physics tell the difference between left and right? Basically. Oh. And he showed well, that would be subjective. Right. But I mean, you know, in other words, is there something in the way that the universe works where you could. I guess the, the so the thought experiment he gives you at the end, which was really fun to go through, was let's imagine you're talking to some alien, some distant alien at some distant star. You know, you don't know where he is. He doesn't know where you are, but you're communicating. And uh, after you develop a language or whatever, is there any way for you to tell him? what the difference between left and right is using physics. Mm. You know, because okay. he goes yeah. through this whole thing of like, well, the alien, once you've got a language working, the alien eventually says, well, you guys are pretty cool. What do you look like? You know? And then Feynman goes, he's like, well, you can, you can tell him, well, we're about six feet tall. And the alien says, well, what's six feet? And then you give him the length of a foot in by stacking hydrogen atoms on top of each other. <laughs> you know, you can do that. You can say, well, if you take, you know, several hundred trillion hydrogen atoms and put them in a line, that's one foot. Now the right. alien who's got, presumably, has a hydrogen atoms because there's a symmetry. You know, this is, again, assuming that the universe is the same everywhere and that hydrogen atoms are basically the same everywhere because he's talking about symmetry. So that now the alien knows what a foot is because he can calculate the length of a bunch of hydrogen atoms. So now he knows how tall we are. Then the alien wants to know what we look like on the inside. So you're like, well, there's this thing called the heart, and it's, it's up in the top part of the body on the left. Right? Well, how does the alien know which side is the left? And how do you yeah. tell him which side is the left side? <laughs> is there anything in fundamental physics that we can use to say that's left versus right? Yeah, yeah. And if there isn't, 
then that implies that there is a symmetry of reflection, that the universe doesn't distinguish between one direction or another, or left and right. But mm. he shows at the end of the discussion that there is a particular kind of, I won't really get into all the details, but there's a particular kind of decay that throws out an electron, and that electron in that decay process is always spinning to the left. And physicists actually don't know why that is, and it actually annoys them because they like things to be symmetrical, <laughs> right? But Feynman was basically suggesting that you could tell the alien to do the experiment, to let that thing decay, and watch the electron come out, and then tell the alien it's spinning to the left, and then the alien will know where to put the heart in his model of the human body <laughs> after that, using fundamental physics. Wow. But then he points out later that it's possible that antimatter... And those same reactions, the electron would come out spinning to the right. <laughs> and that if the alien in his world and everywhere, everywhere, everything that he lives in is made of antimatter, then he may put the heart on the wrong side. <laughs> <laughs> a very good point. Yeah. So he finishes off the explanation that if, if you finally get to go meet the guy and you've told him about the convention of shaking hands and you stick out your right hand and he sticks out his left hand, don't touch him because he's made of antimatter. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Yeah. There was something in all that I was going to comment on and I've completely lost it now. I just love these ideas and exploring this kind of stuff. It's, it's so much fun to think oh, about so this do kind I. of stuff. Yeah. I mean, when, when Joshua Cutchin wrote his book on smells and he's like trying to explain how we really don't know how smell works. Yeah. I'm sitting there going, huh, I, I never knew that, you know? Yep. And like, he, just, he, he points just, out how we don't have the vocabulary to describe smells very well either. No. Yeah. No. <laughs> and I mean, the same with color. I mean, almost anything in our existence is explained by its relation to other things in our existence. Yeah. But, yeah, you know, so when you – early, earlier in the conversation when you were talking about how we don't see in 3D, I was thinking about that. And it's like we, we triangulate because we have two sensors yeah. separated by a distance. So we triangulate and our brain interprets that as distance. And it can be tricked. And yeah. it can definitely be tricked. So it's not real 3D. Right. It's, it, right. it, it is – it's two different sources of data. And it's supplemented by hearing. And Two different sources of data, yeah, yeah. right, that are that are separated by a certain distance from each other. Yeah. And so the brain, and it, it, this is this is fascinating too that that the brain can uh, take these m minuscule differences, like the speed of light or whatever, you know, and the, and the speed of sound reaching one ear. And having a reflection off a wall also kind of d a delayed sense yep. that d gives you this spatial awareness. Yeah, that this that that these processes can happen fast enough to where you can really make damn good guesses about how many steps you have to take to get away from whatever. You know, yes. it, it's it's amazing. But you're right. Like we don't actually. I mean, technically speaking, we don't see three dimensions. It's an interpretation of two different data sets. Yes. Yeah. And it's also uh, experience. Right. Because they, they were talking about people who gain sight later in life have trouble seeing depth. Yep. Mm. Yep, it's, it's binocular, but not necessarily 3D. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, yeah it, and it, I've, it, I, I like to point out, too, that, like you were saying, uh, you know, as far as sight goes... The things that the, the the things that we're looking at are just that that's all of the that's all of the frequent frequencies of resonance that don't jive with the object, right? Like they don't the the object is out of tune with those frequencies of light, so it doesn't absorb them. So it's rejecting all of those frequencies, and that's what we see in our and and we. I don't know. I've just yeah. It's like a reverse. Everything we see is re really a reverse image of what they uh, re actually resonate with. Right. So it's almost like we see the we see them for what they're not. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know what I yeah. mean, I mean, it's still it's it does give you information as to what they are based on what they reject, right? But it's 
Yeah, and you get you get information about shape or whatever, but the color of light that you're seeing that the object looks like it is is actually the color of light that the object is rejecting. Right. Yeah. So the, there was an experiment too. I mean, I, I assume most people understand that like the image projected onto your retina through the eyeball is actually upside down. Yeah. Yes. And then our brain corrects it. Well, years ago they did this was sometime in the early 2000s they did an experiment where they designed glasses that mm -hmm. yeah. Had these people wear that flip the world around, and after a few hours, their brain corrected it. Yep. And then when they eventually took the glasses off, everything was upside down <laughs> for a while until their brain corrected it. Yep. They had to learn to eat and drink. You know, how imagine how difficult it would be to learn to drink when you think everything is upside down. Yes. Hey, man, if yep. you can do keg stands, you'll be all right. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean. It's like it's another example of how much our brain kind of like interprets everything. It for builds us. the world for us. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's like and we're not getting a one to one ratio of what's happening. It's like, oh, here's what we think is important. Oh, hey, look, everything's upside down. Hang on, this will work better. Yeah, right. And and, then, the and we can build these sensors that can detect things, right? That are beyond our our. Uh, what the sensors we have built in to our bodies, we can build sensors that can detect all types of energy and motion. And then we have to convert that into something that's understandable to us. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, that gets tricky too. I mean, it's it, like, think about, um, I think about this, like the radio telescopes, right? They're, they're, they're picking up all this stuff and then they send us this image. Oh, look at this galaxy. Yeah. And you're like, but that's not really what that thing just picked up. Right. Because you have to detune it and change the whole frequencies all the way down to something that shows you something more like the visual spectrum yeah. that we would see. Right. And that's just in, you know, just like detecting an object that's emitting light. I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that we have to, like, think about, um, like, trying to make a... Uh, we, we had looked into this for a while, making a GPR unit, right? Ground penetrating radar. Yeah. Like, it's not too difficult to build a unit that can shoot radar that would has a large enough wavelength to go down into in, into the earth some depth and then reflect back. But you have to build a picture so and then, then you, have you to be got able to this, read it. Yeah, you got this <laughs> giant set of data that's just like got, got signal, didn't get signal, got signal faster. Yeah. And so then you have to come up with some scheme... To build a picture out of that, yeah, that makes sense to us. That's it's, the hard part. That's the real hard part. Hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it's uh, speaking of also speaking of uh, depth perception or seeing in three D. I love that you know the idea that there's this basic difference between animal types, depending on whether or not they, you know, that they they're, whether they're they're hunters or prey. Oh yeah, that the prey yeah. animals always have their eyes on the sides of their head, so they don't have any depth perception, but they have a much wider range of vision because they need to be able to see that hunter coming. Right. Whereas the hunter needs depth perception because he needs to know how far away that prey animal is. You know, yeah. there's this uh, this basic idea. So we have we have this forward facing binocular vision like most other uh, you know predator species, whereas the prey species have their eyes on the sides of their head so they can see almost all the way around them. Yeah, yeah. So they don't have any 3D vision at all, but I bet you their brains still kind of build a depth perception into their into their world picture. Well, sure. Otherwise, they'd be running face first into trees all the yeah, time. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it doesn't work yep. with birds because birds are basic. I mean, a lot of birds are predator birds, and yet they, you know, if you if you've ever been looked at by a large bird, it turns its head. Yeah. And uses one eye. And yet they're pretty, and, the they, and they'll dive. Yeah, owls have their eyes in the front. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, owls are weird. <laughs> yes, yes, they are. Yeah. They're probably owls, not. Yeah. Owls and octopuses. Yes. Those, those are two of the strangest creatures on the planet. Yep. They want us all dead. <laughs> <laughs> and frogs. Let's not, let's not leave out the frogs. That's right. <laughs> the, uh, we had talked about it recently on Where Did the Road Go? Uh, the movie uh, Mag Magnolia ends with a fall of frogs. Oh. Have you guys seen that? I haven't seen that. It was riveting. Oh. 
It was a really it was good a, movie. a riveting ending. <laughs> and the and, and the <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> the the uh, but yeah, the ending is like this this fall of frogs and like the character is like sitting in the library and these frogs are falling and he kind of looks up and goes, "Oh, this is just one of those things that happens." <laughs> And you know that that kind of is what it is. It is. It's totally true. We just don't recognize it as that because it doesn't happen, re- you know, regularly. Yeah, I wonder about that. How often does it actually happen? You know, there's more very remote places on the planet than not. Yeah. So we get reports when it happens in a town or in some farmer's field or whatever, basically where there are people to see it. But how often does it rain frogs into the ocean? You know? Yeah. Or true. fish or, I mean, in the mountains. True. Yeah. And then they get stuck in coal veins. Yeah. And, uh... <laughs> yeah. How, how often do they just teleport into the inside of stuff? Yeah. I guess I, I hadn't thought about that, but something could apport into a coal, coal vein right before it's opened. And then that's why the frog is there. Yep. Hmm. Interesting. Of course, it might also be that coal doesn't form the way we think it does. Yeah. Which is not an idea a lot of scientists like. Right. But still, it's how do you entomb, you know, especially the cases where the, the frog seems to come alive and sort of yeah. leave afterward. It, it changes from being white to green, which isn't too surprising. Frogs can change color. But, you know, it's... Even if coal forms in a totally different way, how do you get frogs in there that are basically in some kind of suspended animation? Right. Yeah. And what is it about frogs that allow them to do that? Yeah. Because you don't get, like, kittens. <laughs> <laughs> we opened this coal mine, the kitten hopped out. Well, there was like, that There was that story about the, what was it? Uh, 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 what was it? It was some kind of giant, they described it like almost like a pterodactyl, like a big bird. That oh, was yeah, trapped in a piece right. of rock or whatever, and they broke it open, and it flopped out of there, and it was pasty white, dusty, but it slowly turned dark, got up and squawked and sort of stumbled off, scared the hell out of everybody. It was this huge thing. You know, I mean, of course, this is just a, it's just a story, but there are stories of snakes and worms and other things than frogs that do this as well. That's, but I, you're right. I, never, I, never, I don't, I don't think I've ever read about a mammal. Bird is probably the... The closest. Mm. Well, I mean, they are dinosaurs. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, it's been a while since I've read Fort's book. I forgot all about that. All right. Um, so do you want to do another story? What do you want to do? Sure. You got one more? I do. I do. I had this. We were talking earlier about... Um, cops and how like people won't won't you know are like oh we don't want to believe these stupid peasants or whatever but then when a cop sees something they want to dismiss that too you know it's like okay um so this is an old story but it's one i've i've always been fascinated with because it, it has a decent amount of research done on it, it comes from melmagazine.com this particular article and it's uh the minnesota cop who crashed his patrol car into a ufo <laughs> In 1979, a sheriff's department or deputy in rural Minnesota encountered what he could only describe as an unidentified flying object, and no expert investigator or engineer could ever prove him wrong. On a late August night in 1979, Deputy Sheriff Val Johnson was on patrol in rural Marshall County, Minnesota. The closest town was 10 miles away, and the night was still. The fields around him quiet and empty. Suddenly, Johnson saw a bright light streak through streak across the darkness above. He grabbed a hold of the wheel of his patrol car and hung a left on State Highway 220. Um, Johnson kept racing toward whatever it was, but then the light shifted and began to head in his direction, right at him, in fact. It grew brighter and brighter until he heard glass shatter. The light had entered his patrol car. Everything turned to black and Johnson lost consciousness. What happened next has remained a mystery for the last 43 years. 
He later told local reporter Jillian Rice of Channel 5 Eyewitness News uh, that I traveled about a mile and the light seemed to intercept me, so to speak. It came right up on me. It was painful. The light was extremely brilliant and painful. I closed my eyes and heard the sound of breaking glass, and that's the last thing I remember. Hmm. For the skeptics at home, Rice ran down all the questions and suspicions they might be entertaining. Johnson was unconscious for 40 minutes before he radioed for help and was taken to the hospital, she explained. A doctor, and later an eye specialist, confirmed that Johnson had suffered mild welder or flash burns to his eyes. Ooh. But this wasn't the only curious physical effect of the event. Even stranger, both Johnson's wristwatch and electric clock in his patrol car had mysteriously stopped for 14 minutes, she reported. Moreover, Rice added, at the scene of the accident, skid marks show Deputy Johnson coasted for another 800 feet after impact before applying the brakes. Wow. No noting that the area around the crash site had been searched, but nothing was found. Police considered the notion of a small airplane, but Johnson specifically remembered not hearing any engine noise. Plus, nothing could explain how the two spring-mounted antenna on the patrol car became bent at a near-perfect 90-degree angle. Huh. If it wasn't another car, a small plane, or a person on a bicycle with a bright headlight, what did Johnson hit, and what could account for the missing 14 minutes on his watch and patrol car clock? In subsequent interviews, Johnson attempts to describe in exacting detail everything he remembered. The problem was, it didn't sound like anything you'd find on Earth. For, on, for instance, Johnson said in his recorded police interview, I noticed a very bright light, brilliant light, 8 to 12 inches in diameter, 3 to 4 feet off the ground. The edges were very defined. He also described the light hitting him like a 200-pound pillow. In yet another interview about the incident, he again described the mysterious nature of what happened. I saw a ball of light, I drove toward it, and suddenly it was in the car with me. It's unexplainable and will remain so. I'm happy with my mental stability. <laughs> Johnson has also been consistent ever since the accident first happened, including when he first regained consciousness and called in to dispatch in the car radio. Uh, so it was 404, what's your condition? I don't know, I just hit my car. Just Something just hit my car. What's your condition? Are you okay? Something attacked my heart, car. I heard the glass breaking and the locks, the brakes locked up. I don't know what's going on. Uh, Marshall County Sheriff Dennis Brock led the investi investigation and believed the word of his deputy. I feel what, whatever Val told me about the light and the strange incident was true. I don't doubt Val in any way. Hmm. That's dead. He still had to investigate. The FAA assisted from their end, reporting that there were no aircraft in the skies above Marshall County at the time. So Breck went a less traditional route and reached out to the Center for UFO St Studies in suburban Chicago. An investigator from the center visited the site, examined the car, and ran a battery test, checking for anomalies of magnetism and radioactivity. He concluded that whatever it was, it wasn't radioactive. It's a mystery, Rice would let her later tell her news camera, or as the UFO investigator from Illinois said, it appears to have been a close encounter of the second kind. Uh, they actually still have the car, too. Um, after the UFO research, Honeywell Labs sent out an engineer in November 1979 to conduct, to conduct some tests on the metal of the patrol car. They, too, came to the conclusion they had no idea what happened. The car antennas appeared to be bent as a result of a of high velocity blasts of air, which he determined meant some sort of electrical thing or perhaps a force had caused the impact and resulting damage. The automaker for the patrol car, which was a 1977 Ford LTD, sent out its own engineers to examine the vehicle as well. I have not seen anything like this before. Ford crash investigator Meridian French said in his report French wrote that it seemed as if inward and outward forces acting almost simultaneously had slammed into the car similarly the damage from front to back was within a straight line only one foot wide the vehicle has been preserved as an exhibit at the Marshall County Historical Society which society president uh, president Kent Broughton says is definitely the number one attraction according wow. to him the Roll car attracts an inquisitive visitors from all over the world. Um, some people lay on the floor and look underneath it. He told <laughs> Roadside America, once I saw a guy with a black light flashlight going over the car. Wow, that's cool. They have it on. You can go see on it. Display. Yeah, yeah. Dude, the... Oh, go ahead. 
out of everyone involved, Johnson seems to be the less impressed with the least impressed with what happened to him that fateful summer night. <laughs> As he said in past interviews, he'd much rather be done with the incident and focus on focus on the future instead. I looked up at the sky and said, "Well, shucks, what happened?" And then I shuffled on with my life. <laughs> For a while, of course, he was inundated with media requests, but eventually, other stories came along and pushed me off the front page. Thank goodness. <laughs> Even still, strangers often approached him over the years, wanting to go over everything with him themselves. We'd sit in the backyard with lemonade and and talk, he told the Minneapolis Post last October. They'd tell me what they thought happened to me, and I'd nod at the appropriate times, and eventually they'd go away. <laughs> <laughs> For his part, Johnson did make peace with what had happened, as he told the studio audience in a 1980 sh- uh, on the 1980 show, That's Incredible. Upon reflection, we've come to the conclusion that perhaps the creator has made other things we can't readily see or readily identify, and perhaps this is one of the things we encountered on the road. Without a doubt, he definitely grown to see the light, whatever that light might have been. <laughs> End it with a pun, of course. <laughs> I think it's hilarious that they're talking about a guy on a bicycle or maybe an airplane, but he had welding burns in his eyes. Yeah. You know, who? Yeah. what airplane or bicycle light... Is going to give you welding burns. Right. That's a specific kind of ultraviolet, you know. I like the part about the 200-pound pillow. (laughs) Because that, I mean, that just sounds like uh, anti-gravity or something, right? It's got this... Some kind of inertial... Like, you think about uh, the... If you you had some kind of, like, anti-gravity generating machine thing that could basically generate a pushing force... Yeah. And then it ran, it, it, it zoomed up on you real quick. That's kind of what it would feel like because you'd start feeling it. It wouldn't be a direct impact. You'd yeah. start feeling it from a distance and then the force would get stronger as it got closer yeah. to you. Yeah, and it runs into you and then pushes out everything outward. So you get the, like what the engineer said, that like a simultaneous impact from inside and outside the car. Yeah. Yeah. It is interesting. I love that all these people came and checked out the vehicle and... <laughs> Right, it, yeah. and you know, I don't want to. I don't want to bring up the ball lightning, but I'm going to bring up ball lightning. It some of it sounded ball lightning esque to me. You know, a small. He was talking about a very defined, extremely bright sphere that basically went through his car and did a bunch of destruction, but it didn't actually kill him. You know, yeah. Uh, but yeah, and then they were saying it looks like something went through the car with a destructive force, but left a path about a foot wide. It sounds like a small object. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, it could be it could have I mean, I guess ball lightning could possibly or something like that, some kind of plasma ball or whatever you yeah. want to call it, could could make the same kind of sort of ultraviolet light that that welding does. I've had welding burns in my I eyes. I mean, that's it what is it is. Not, it's an electrical arc. Yeah, it's not it it hurts. It is not comfortable. Oh, it all comes back to electricity. Yeah, it, does. it sure does, yeah. I was gonna say <laughs> somebody should come up with a theory. <laughs> that it sort of puts that stuff together. And explains everything in the universe. It would be cool. Right. Yeah, yeah. that's a really good idea. <laughs> you should work Lightning on Lightning universe. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, you could be dealing with a plasma intelligence. Yep. Um, you know, that was like, what's this thing? I'm going to go check it out. Yeah. I mean, it could have been a probe. I mean, you know, a small object that was producing that ball lightning looking phenomena yeah. around it i mean i don't know it's but it, it is interesting it does sound technological but also could have a totally natural uh source it was probably yeah, made yeah. by cat aliens because <laughs> somebody was following it and it ran up there and smacked them and then failed <laughs> and, and the thing about it is there's so much evidence that something happened you know like there's yeah. there's it's not like people are looking at this car and going oh i can explain all this everyone's right. like uh <laughs> nope, that's weird yep <laughs> And you don't get that. Usually you get the stupid, skeptical stuff that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. No, that's a great story. I like that one. It's a good one. And it's always been one of my favorites because you have the damn car and it happened to a cop. Yeah. And there's no hypnosis. There's no aliens came and abducted me. He's just like, I don't know what the hell happened, but yeah. it sucked. Yeah. <laughs> have some lemonade. Leave me alone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that part. That yeah. <laughs> Nods at all the appropriate Tell me times. Dirty <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sounds like a nice sure, guy. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so that that's that that kind of tied in the 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 dismissing reports and uh, electrical universe all in one. It yeah. did. 
Nicely done. And, and the bending of the antennas without breaking them is also really fascinating. Yeah. And it makes me think of the crop circle stuff. I want to know why the guy said that they were bent by a blast of air. Is that just, does he have evidence that it was air? Or does he just think that whatever it was, was, you know, he's trying to come up with a, whatever it was, it wasn't a hard impact. So he's thinking yeah, it was a blast yeah. of air. Yeah. That would be my guess because I mean, you, you figure it, it had to bend them without breaking. Yeah. Or denting them or whatever. Yeah. 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 So if they're both bent at, I mean, to bend an antenna at a 90 degree angle is generally just going to snap it. Yeah. Oh, I was thinking that, well, oh, maybe I, I I made a fake picture in my head when I was hearing that part, but I was thinking of the big, you know, they got the springs at the base. Oh. Yeah, I was that thinking, I are they, are, I was thinking, are they, are they the extendable tube kind? Yeah, because that, you, for sure, you can't bend those without 90 degrees without breaking them. Yeah. Let's or is it the can... cop kind where it's basically a, a, a short, hard, rubber-coated antenna? It just depends on what kind of antennas they were. I'm looking at the picture, but I don't see any antennas, so they may have removed them. Uh. Um, they they do have a wax figure of him, <laughs> <laughs> of the cop. Yep. Really? <laughs> wow. Okay, so there is an antenna. No, that is that an antenna? I saw on the wall. Yeah, there's no. Uh, I don't see any antennas. Yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a smaller picture. So. Either way, I mean, if it was the spring at the base, like one of those bigger, like a CB antenna or a you know yep. long range radio antenna, that usually they're long antennas, but they have the spring at the base where they can flop. Yep. To get that thing to bend ninety degrees and stay, to, it would take a lot of heat. Yes. Right. Yeah. Flash heating. Yeah, that's right. It would want to spring back. Let's uh, let's let's do a web search and see if I can find a picture of the antenna. Uh, images, yeah. or he might be able to come up with it with what, like what was standard cop, <laughs> cop gear at the time. <laughs> so there's there's much. Oh, there's this cracked windshield. Uh, the windshield just looks like it has a crack in it, like it didn't take the whole windshield out, which is interesting. It's not like a big smashed hole. Yeah. Uh, there is an antenna on the car that is not bent, unless, of course, they replace them after. I mean, because the windshield's oh, the windshield is cracked. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know what type of. I mean, any type of antenna is going to be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, like I said, it, it puts me in the mind of crop circles where they they bend them without breaking them. Yep. And it seems to be a source of heat right at the base. Yeah. Yep. Ah, here we go. Okay, so it's the antenna. It's not quite at a 90-degree angle. It is the type that has, so it starts out with a big solid base coming right by the uh, the siren on top, and then it goes to a springy bit. Yep. And then it goes to a thinner wire that goes up about, it looks like maybe a foot, and then suddenly arcs at more of a, not quite a 90-degree angle, maybe a... A little less. Oh, okay. Than a, oh, so it's bent See, up high. A, these are solid core yeah. antenna. Then yeah. it's a it's a big, solid piece of steel. Wow. And it's only bent in that one spot. Up up high, like a foot off the the car or yeah. something. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's above where the uh, the lights are uh, above the the height of the lights. And these okay, are old yeah. So it might have. Lights. I wonder if it pushed them against the 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 lights and then bent it down. Nope, bent the other way. Oh, it's the other direction. Okay. Yep. Um, I, I will, I will see if I could share it here with you. Can I, can I do that? I could not do that. I have no easy way to do that. Cool. Don't try. <laughs> you'll, you're, uh, you'll blow something up. I'm, <laughs> I'm on my tablet, which has no ways I can communicate with you on. Uh, well, you can just Google it. Yeah. We'll look it up. Uh, what a great, what a great story. Listening. Yeah. What a great story. So, I mean, and you never hear about this story. That's the other thing. Like all these other UFO stories you hear all the time. This one is like never out there. Yeah, you're right. I've read a lot of UFO books. I don't think I've ever heard come across that one. Maybe in I passing, mean, it, but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Maybe because it's not, doesn't come across as extraterrestrial. Like, yeah, that's nuts and bolts. People don't like it very much. Cause there's nothing there that, that suggests that a spaceship crashed into him. 
Right. And I, I'm kind of surprised looking at the windshield. It's just a small little hole in the windshield, which would suggest, I think one of you said, you know, it could have been something small emanating out a field around it. Yeah. Something very small with a lot of energy around it. Yeah. Yeah. Also could have been plasma doing something like that. Yep. That is a sweet cop car, though. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, for anyone, I would I got a fiction recommendation. Um, oh, yeah, I think there's a there's a book called Ball Lightning. Um, it's written by a Chinese guy. Uh, it's really good, and he the suggestions that he makes. And this guy's an engineer, you know, so he he writes pretty good fiction. Hard, I would call it hard science fiction. But he makes some pretty cool uh, speculations and suggestions about what ball lightning might actually be. Really? So you saying that there's a tiny hole and me thinking about ball lightning was it made me think of that book. So I, you know, if anybody's interested in ball lightning and want to read some good fiction about it and about what what it might be, check that book out. Are, are you going to tell us this theory? Uh, no, that would that would kind of ruin some stuff in the book. I don't want to. I don't want to do any okay. spoilers. All right. <laughs> <laughs> fiction. But it's great because he actually goes through a lot of the mysterious cases. Oh. You know, he, he he's bringing in how mysterious ball lightning actually is. And so in the book, you know, even though it's fiction, he's telling you about how mysterious this phenomena really is. And then the fiction sort of has the characters in it, the physicists in it, sort of figuring stuff out. And it's really interesting. Nice. That in a way that explains all these mysterious things that ball lightning has been known to do. Let me, huh. let me find the guy's name so I can. Uh, his name is. It's well, I don't know how to pronounce it exactly. C I C I X I N L I U. Yeah. C yeah. Xing Lu. Yeah, probably. Let me make sure that's. He the also name. has one called the Wandering Earth. Yeah, he has a bunch of uh, his three body problem trilogy is one some of the best science fiction I've ever read, and that that's I'll say that. Huh. Too. Yeah. All right. Hey, it's 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 a free it's free with your uh, Audible trial. Oh yeah, yep. The three body problem and ball lightning both have uh, Audible versions. Nice. I'll have to save that. Not 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 that I can order anything from Amazon, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> um, was it one of you guys who suggested I play the game Control? I did. Yes. Oh yeah, you were right. Yeah. Holy crap, is that game good? Yes. Fantastic. I'm glad you got it. And and anyone who's into the paranormal should definitely play Control if yes. you like video games. <laughs> Whoever made that game knew what they were talking about. They did. Absolutely. Because there's so many little hints. Yep. You know, like you find papers all over talking about different projects, right down to the way they do disinformation. Yep. That's and right. then the concepts of what's going on right then and there that yep. you're playing through is it's just it's so brilliant. All right. Yes. I totally agree. <laughs> <laughs> Control is and, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's I haven't finished it yet. I'm probably 75 percent of the way through. It's a big game. Oh, too. yeah. It's it's a huge, huge game. Yeah. Because I got it. It was on sale for like 30 bucks with all the download packs. Oh, yeah. Excellent. So I was like, okay, that sounds like a good deal. And uh, yeah, I mean, and the thing is, the references aren't always that blatant either. This is why I said whoever designed it kind of knows their their stuff. Yep. It seemed you know? to me that way that they had done their research. Yeah, and that so they were also they were also very familiar with the whole uh, SCP foundations. It was very. Yeah, SCP like yeah. in in a way because you're dealing with this giant government hidden governmental organization. Yeah, which you know is also something that could exist. Yep. I mean, we know the government's always looking into this stuff. Yeah. You know what government? <laughs> <laughs> All of them probably. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, it's like the the the, the revelations of. The government has a secret UFO program. Are kind of like the revelations of Rob Halford's gay. It's like right, <laughs> and, and then people go, "Rob Halford's gay." This what? It's like you didn't know. Yeah, it's like this is common knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> it's like okay, well, 
of course, you know, if there's something out there, the, the government, any government can use for its advantage, it's going to. Yeah, and they're made up of a bunch of people that are just, you know, most of them are just people like us that are probably all have their various interests. And, you know, it's not like it seems more like in the in the scientific community, you have, you know, like a, it's it's very standard to just completely um, pass off that stuff as, you know, BS. Yeah. Oh, whereas, yeah, yeah. Yeah, whereas outside of the, uh, outside of the scientific community, a lot of people think that these things might really exist, and that's the government's going to be made up of mostly those types of people. Yep. Yeah. So yeah, they're going to be and looking. They into bring it. in scientists, swear them to secrecy, and then show them that that's some right. of this stuff might be real, and then those <laughs> scientists can't talk about it. <laughs> that's right. Oh, <laughs> uh, well, that seems like a good place to end. What do you think? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you, your band has a new album out. That's right. We do. Uh, Procession is the name of the album by Fifty Dollar Dynasty. We, uh, you can go to the website fiftydollardynasty.com. It's free there. Uh, it is. It's a little. It's a very simple website with a donate button and a playlist, so you can play the album f directly from the website, or you can uh, download the individual files as well from the player. Um, you can also find it on Spotify. Yeah, it's on all the streaming platforms. Yep. But, you know, uh, we were trying to do the value for value model. And when you publish to the streaming platforms, there's a couple, Amazon and Apple iTunes, that you cannot set the price at zero. Really? Right. So we just set it at a basically normal price, 12 bucks for the album. But you can get it for free from the website, and then if you want to donate or support the band, you can donate from the links on the website. And we also have a Patreon. Yeah, so they're putting out they're putting out special content through their Patreon, um, and you get to you can hear the instrumental versions, and there's lots of short videos of them working on stuff or us practicing, and you know, cool stuff. Nice. Well, you want to pick a song to end this show with? Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what do you suggest? Me, yeah. Oh man. Well, what you know? I'm thinking of where did the road go? Audience here. I just give them Deus. Yeah, there you go. End it with Deus. That'll do it. And hey, what's Deus about? Um, <laughs> it's not Sum about anything. Summoning the war gods. <laughs> <laughs> I see. It's mostly instrumental. It's yeah. instrumental, but it has a chant at the end. Yeah. So. Ah, okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, yeah, thank Ryan. You, Why buddy. don't you, for our audience, tell people where they can find you if they don't know, which they should. That, that would be wheredidtheroadgo.com, which has everything Where Did The Road Go related, all our links, social media, shows all the way back to the first show in 2013 that's downloadable. All right. And uh, lots of Patreon content for $3 a month if anyone wants to become a Patreon. All right. Thanks, Soraya. Always a pleasure. Indeed. Yeah, buddy. Good night. Uh, hey.
Shalom. 